Absolutely. So good evening, everybody. This is the Ordinance Committee meeting of June 9th. I want to announce that we are doing video recording, and we're taking minutes, so whatever you say is going to be on record word for word. Um, and we are recording. We call the meeting to order. We take the role of Councilor O'Donnell and myself are the only ones sitting tonight. Councilor Carney is away, I guess. Um, so a motion to approve minutes of um, of May 12th, 2000. So move with, with a minor correction. Mm -hmm. um, and that's uh, the name of, of Fred Zimnock. Um, it was written. Fred something else? It's something else. Fred something else. But I'd just like to correct his last name, Zimnock. But yeah, otherwise, so move with that one correction. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Now, we usually ask for public comment now, but I think everybody's here to speak on a specific issue, correct? So you can speak now or you can wait till till the specific issue comes up we're going to talk about that you're interested in whatever is your choice. And seeing no one rushing to the podium, I'm assuming everybody's going to wait until we get to the issue that they're here for. Um, so our first item is an appointment of Peter Frothingham to the housing partnership for a term uh, filling in an unexpired term of Patty McGill from May 2012 until May 2015. I, I would I would move we make a positive recommendation. Mm -hmm. um, I spoke with Mr. Rothingham about this appointment and I think he has a lot of skills to bring to position and uh, philosophy about affordable housing that I think is good for the city. And I've known Mr. Frothingham for years and I think he's a wonderful person for the partnership. So I'll second that. Great. And uh, since we both like them, I think there's no further discussion. No. no. <laughs> All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. And next we have three ordinances that are related. And then 312-102, parking prohibited at all times on Maple Street in Florence. Another ordinance, 312-104, um, limited time parking on Maple Street in Florence. And then 312-117, uh, on street and off street handicapped parking spaces. And I think the, we, these are all related. Mm -hmm. um, to the same handicapped parking space that we uh, we talked about, yeah. and this we, this went to trans transportation yep. parking. Yep, these three ordinances received the positive recommendation for transportation parking, and, and they're back to us. And they're back to us. So I, I would move we take them as a group, perhaps. Mm -hmm. okay. And all right, uh, and I'll second that. So I think these are the ones that you're all here to speak to. So please, we'll take your comment, yeah. Councilor. You want to? Councilor LaBarge, I think when Alex came, who's the engineer who was on site with us, um, explained exactly why we needed to have that handicapped parking. I, as a city councilor, for a good two to three years, have received calls from elderly on my ward and in the center of Florence area and throughout the city about going to the post office. There's no handicapped parking, also over by Birds South. We do have a handicapped parking coming over by um, the Florence Diner, which we've been waiting because Richard Parzoletti has been very busy with potholes and everything, so they're going to put that one up. That was approved way back. And um, it's very critical that we have the handicapped parking placed on Maple Street to accommodate people with many different types of disabilities. Okay. So as Council Lavarge had stated, um, there's been numerous uh, individuals who have asked for additional handicap parking in Florence. And um, there was already one approved, I believe it was in 1999, in front of the diner, which was an area we were looking at, but had since found out from Alex at the DPW that that space was already approved. So the other one was um, in front of birds, and um, it needs to be expanded because it was going to be too short, too close to the curb, as well as um, restricted uh, time frame uh, for parking. So the Commission on Disability is highly supportive of this uh, in Florence. So this will make actually three handicapped spots on public streets in Florence, which really is not a lot. But it's a great start. So thank you. Anybody else here to speak to handicapped space in the park? 
Anything else to uh, say about it? Uh, I would just like to thank Council LaBarge and Director Shaughnessy, and uh, thank you for your indulgence in uh, allowing us to be part of the Transportation Parking Commission, which uh, which saw that it was a great idea. Uh, a question. Will this come into City Council? When would the date be? Thursday. The next Thursday. Oh, meeting. great. Yeah. Thank you. The 19th? Yeah. So I would move approval. Okay, and I'll second that. Okay. Any more discussion? No. All in favor of a positive recommendation? Aye. Aye. So those are all done as group. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. Did you I think we need a state or social services and government affairs. You're not going to be there. So I have to apologize. It appears that the city solicitor has determined that we are not able to. Oh, this is the whole council. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, that we are not able to add appointments that were referred to us last Thursday to our agenda, which seems unusual to me. Um, but we have people here tonight that we invited, so what we're going to do is conduct our little interview tonight, and then we will have to wait till our next meeting under these circumstances to actually send it back to council, uh, because we're told we can't add it Friday to an agenda that we posted on Thursday, which seems strange to me, but that's what the man said, right? It's, uh, if we're under the 48 hour uh, window, then we can't. Can't, can't do it. So, Mr. Frothingham was on the published agenda. We knew he was coming. Um, and let's see that. That's June 5th. So, um, did Diane come in? Uh, I, I spoke, spoke with her. Yeah. Okay, but we can't we can't do that. Yeah. But Chris Bissell is here, and the mayor has appointed Chris to be our new treasurer. So while we cannot vote on it tonight, we'll do our interview with you tonight, so you don't have to come back again. And then we'll discuss and vote on your being treasurer at our next meeting. Do you know when the next meeting is scheduled? Um, I'm gonna because I didn't know this was happening until I got here, so. We may actually, since you're scheduled to start at the end of the month, I'm going to check with the mayor and see if we are going to go through the mechanism of having a special meeting solely for the purpose of recommending you so we can vote on you, so that when you start working as treasurer, you'll actually be the treasurer. <laughs> Hope you feel special. Yeah. Yeah. So, absolutely. So, take the podium. You're on it. Well, thank you, Mr. Murphy. <laughs> Um, so, my name is Christine Bissell. Um, I worked previously as the assistant treasurer in the city for nearly five years, and um, upon the, the pre prior treasurer's retirement, um, I decided to apply to come back. Now, you left being the assistant treasurer to go to Palmer? To, um, I left to take a, posi a higher position in the town of Palmer as a treasurer collector. Okay. Yep. You advanced. I advanced. And now you're advancing here and closer to home. Correct. That's correct. A lot closer to home for me. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you have any particular questions for Chris? I've known Chris for 20 years. We're thereabouts, yeah. 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 And, and remember her from working with George as assistant mm -hmm. treasurer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I don't have any particular questions. I'm reading your resume, and um, I think that's uh, for me sufficient. Well, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thanks for coming back to Northampton. Yeah, I'm looking forward. Good to have you. Good to have you back. Good to be back home. Absolutely. Thank you. So we can't we can't act on it tonight, but I'm thinking we may end up having a special meeting at some point, so we can send it to council prior to the 19th. Prior to the night, so we'll do it prior to the 19th, so we can send it to council for the 19th, so you can get appointed. So when you start at the end of the month, you're actually approved as treasurer. Official. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Now we had some reappointments to the Council on Aging, but they didn't come in, so we can do them when we meet on the, 
at, a little, at our special meeting as well. Um, so we're catching up with those things. Um, what, what is everyone else here for? Because we, we have a public hearing coming at 5.30, but we should take care of everybody else before that public hearing if we can and get you on your way. The public hearing. You're here for the public hearing? Okay. Good. Everybody, everyone else is here for the public hearing? I can see you waiting. I'm on the planning board. Oh, you're on the, I can't really. That's okay. I can't really see that far back. And but, Okay, so you're here for that. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Marianne. Okay. Thank you. All right, so we'll go back to our ordinances to see how many of those we've done. We did the parking spaces. <clears throat> we have May 15th, Amend 350, Section 2-1, Affordable Units, referred to us by Council on May 15th. Um, this is something I believe the Director of Planning has suggested. And I don't see him here today. Um, I was also going to ask uh, you, Mr. Chairman, if you'd be comfortable referring this to Ed Lou, since it has to do with housing. And it didn't. Did it go anywhere else? Pam, yeah, on the 15th. No, I'm very happy to send it to Ed Lou because I was surprised it didn't go anywhere else. So, shall we return it to council and request it get sent to Ed Lou? That would seem that, to be a good idea. Okay, that's that's fine with me. Should I make that motion? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll second that. Okay. <laughs> okay. All in favor? Aye. Good. All right. That goes to Edward. Um, and then we get the public hearing. And if we move to 353-4 rezone all city conservation land to farm forest and rivers. Um, that went out on the first. It went to the planning board. It went that went to Edlu. And it came to us. And do we know if Ed Lou responded to that yet? They, uh, we did. Um, we, yeah, it was positive. Positive. I recall in our last meeting, the ordinance, we decided to wait for the planning board to comment. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if, if we might recognize um, our planning board member, Ms. Brooks. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's on the agenda that I got as well. So For, for yes. your next meeting? Uh, you're talking about the. The farm forest, forest and zoning yeah. uh, for today. Um, I mean, they sent it to me for the joint meeting. So, mm -hmm. and this oh, I see. this is a zoning change. Um, but I don't. Let's see. I don't mm -hmm. see it on the advertisement for the public hearing. And that advertisement was done by Carolyn. Mm -hmm. So we'll have to wait on that one until she gets here and see if it's included in the advertisement for tonight. Okay. Yeah. In which case, my thought would be that we wait for the planning board to actually respond to it. Okay. And then, so we'll see by the end of the meeting if we can come back to it. Um, the other order is the one, um, Amend 350, 2- Oh, that's before we miss. Um, Amend our rules in the order 11 about the order of business um, with regards to the finance committee. And uh, that one, Councilor Rivard has left. That's, um, I think, the one that, that uh, Councilor Adams submitted. Mm -hmm. And it was changed. Did you see the changes that came from Attorney Seawald? Oh, I'm not sure. I yeah, he edited, okay. um, I don't mean edited, but he just uh, updated um, Councillor Adams' ordinance. And, uh, it's, here. It's, in, it's in this packet somewhere. Uh, Yeah, this is, I think, the, the one that got changed. I'm not sure what draft that is. Okay. I got this on Friday. Yeah, I think this is the one that Alan... Uh, do, 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 do. Yeah. So, what Councillor Adams was interested in was being able to... Uh, yeah, this, this is the one we have. That's good. Um, 
I think we talked about this once at council. We we set up finance to meet during council so that basically everybody was participating, even though finance votes on it and then it comes back up in a regular council meeting. And I think Councillor Adams mentioned at the last meeting we just spent 40 minutes talking about all those items. Mm -hmm. At least in my mind, the benefit is when it comes up later, we just vote on it rather than have to talk about it all over again. Mm -hmm. So it, we do spend a little extra time, but perhaps 10 minutes extra time mm -hmm. to vote on the orders which everybody's already talked about. Um, what council or what? Yeah, I'm calling you councilor. Attorney Sewell decided, um, was it the Finance Committee shall review all proposed orders mm -hmm. referred to the committee, but nothing herein shall be construed to require that any such proposed order submitted to the City Council by the Mayor be referred to the committee. So that, yes, the, you know, protocol says they go there, but Council can determine to not refer them at all and take them in Council session directly. Mm -hmm. And I spoke to the mayor and Bill, the White Council President, and the finance director about it because it would almost seem to me when they put the agenda together, they would develop some sort of protocol for what would need to go to finance and what they would put on the agenda of directed committee. So perhaps things like budgetary transfer, you know, budgetary transfers or things within the, you know, things moving around within the budget may just come directly to council. Mm -hmm. But things that are, are more involved mm -hmm. would still go to the finance committee. Mm -hmm. So it would sort of still happen the way it's happening, but a number of the things that we just sort of pass as a normal course of business, mm -hmm. they could just put on the later agenda. Um, but council hasn't talked about that yet. Right. And um, the mayor and councilor Dwight have taken it under advisement, but they haven't said anything, nor is the finance director. So we could either keep it here till they respond to it, or we could forward it, because the real discussion is to happen in council, I think, because it affects the agenda. So we could choose to just say thanks for sending it here, but refer it back to council without, a, without comment, mm -hmm. and let it come up at that point. And then hopefully by our next meeting, Councilor Dwight and the mayor would have gotten together and say, Here's how we propose, because essentially, this is like no change, other than we acknowledge the fact that council could choose not to refer something. Right. So, but I'm thinking yeah. Yeah. that's something that's probably going to happen when the agenda gets put together, what do you think? Right, so my question would be, who is making the decision about what goes to finance? Yeah. Is it the full council? Yeah. You know, and it sounds like it would not be the full council. Yeah. Because, uh, and, my thought on it was perhaps the mayor and the council president will develop a protocol that we would approve uh -huh. that would sort of set a threshold for uh -huh. if it's a, you know if it's an interdepartmental transfer or if it you know if it's certain yeah. regular financial things yeah. it can come straight to council yeah. but if it if it requires more deliberation then we send it to finance. Yeah, I have to admit I have I have my questions about uh, the wisdom of, of this change. I don't know if this committee is the right time for me to bring them up, though. So I sort of see the wisdom of you. What, what you said in terms of no yeah, recommendation. send it to council and let it be just because it affects. It isn't going to make a substantive change since we're all going to talk about it. Right. In the current process, we right. talk about it in finance, and then we vote in council. Yeah. Whether so, whether we talk about it in finance or whether we talk about it in council. It really doesn't save as much time as I think Councillor Adams thinks it will. Just the vote. Just the vote, right. which goes quickly if it's already been talked about. Exactly. So, um, if you want to move that we just send it to Council without okay. without recommendation, I think that's really where the discussion should take place because it affects everybody. Uh, I agree, so I, I so moved. Okay, and I'll second that. Okay. Um, and no one's here to talk about this Council housekeeping thing. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Okay, so it goes back without a recommendation. And I'll see if I can't suggest that the mayor and the council president, the finance director, talk this over and maybe come with a proposal for us mm -hmm. um, as to how they would use this tool if we gave it to them and see if people like that. Should it be referred to finance? <laughs> <laughs> you should finance it. I mean, yeah. You know. Well, we can always put it on the. Well, I guess the council will do that, right? Uh, 
Absolutely. But since they both meet at the, <laughs> meet at the same time, it's a little council so humor. But a little council humor. Okay. Very good. So I'm thinking um, we've done Peter. We've done the parking ones. We're recommending the affordable goes to Ed Little. We sent finance committee back without comment to be discussed by everyone. We have our public hearing that we haven't done yet, and we've got the conservation land that we need to. Oh, Carolyn's here. Hi, Carolyn. Oh, it's on there. <laughs> there as well. All right. So, Carolyn, we, um, we were advised by the city solicitor today that um, the items that we put on our revised agenda after the council meeting uh -huh. that we could not consider tonight because due notice was not given. So we had some appointments and things that were on our agenda for this meeting. Okay. When, when did we advertise farm, forest, and rivers, and the, and the, and the affordable unit zoning? Um, we're going to be part May, of May twenty fourth. Okay. So that and June second. Okay. So we can do the. So they can be in the public hearing because that was the public hearing was done early enough. Um, it might not have been. And Far Forest and Rivers is on our agenda. Um, but the planning board has not acted on that yet, right, till the public hearing. Uh, uh, right. This is a joint public hearing right. over that, too. But so they need to have their... Okay. Yeah. Because we would not theoretically act on it till after the planning board made its recommendation. You could... That's that's true, but you could also do it this evening at this, after they make after a recommendation. After they make their... You, you don't have to wait till yeah. your next meeting. No, as long as... Yeah, and we yeah. could certainly do that because farm, they're both farm, forests, and rivers and affordable units are on our agenda published for tonight. Right. Correct one. Right. So we could do that. Okay. Farm, forests, and rivers is not on the published agenda for the hearing. Well, it Just was, but Car Carolyn, when yeah. she published it in the newspaper, okay. she published it with this thing on it. I also double posted this hearing uh, as a planning board joint hearing with ordinance. So I think there's two postings yeah. for tonight, and they, and certainly uh, uh, that one went in last week, plenty, way ahead of the 48 hours. Okay, good. So we can do it. You can act on it, and then we could act on it when you're, when right. you're done acting on it. Right. And I, yeah. So good, so we can catch up with those. So it's only the poor treasurer and a couple. And some ordinances. Uh, okay. Okay. Although it's not on this, just, so, just to be clear. This is, this is the ordinance agenda. And in the description of the public hearing, the only items are the ordinance. Mm -hmm. But it was posted elsewhere. Okay. So. Being 5.30. Why don't we have our planning board member to join us? So while the planning board is joining us, there's for everybody there's two committees, ordinance and planning board. So while they're getting organized, we have a motion to open, reopen our public hearings. So moved. Second. In favor? Aye. I feel outnumbered. We have, we have a full house tonight. Uh -huh.
Actually, yeah, and, and I might suggest once you guys call yourselves to order, that you introduce everybody around them to the, for the camera. Good evening, sir. So we, we just opened our public hearing, so we'll throw it to you to get us to speed here. Planning board call the public hearing. Um, we're going to suggest going around since we have guests to introduce ourselves. Um, yes, Carly on the live planning board. Bill Grinnell, planning board. Tess Carlo, planning board. Alan Burson, planning board. Dan Felton, planning board. As we all are. Ian Brooks, planning board. John Watts, planning board. And Devin Bruce, planning board. Um, Mark. Uh, Sullivan usually chairs this, but he is not with us tonight, so I will. Um, open for public comment. Well, uh, we could, um, I could describe, sir, the, the, you all, this, the first item is the um, issue of replacement language for the seven more units, a continuation from the May, not, um, sorry, 12th public hearing. Um, to give, I think, board members some more time to sort of think about what was here, maybe gather some more information. Um, there were a couple of issues, um, concerns raised about, um, you know, the, the, a couple of items um, that were um, um, discussed quite a bit. One was the issue about the park and the size of the park and the square footage. Um, issues about the um, environmental um, um, standards, performance standard, as well as the affordable housing performance standard. So um, there have been some conversations between the um, last meeting and this meeting just um, with um, counselors, and, and um, I think it might make sense to talk about that. And Counselor um, Donald, you have some more information you want to bring. I also wanted to just um, pass out, in case anybody didn't have hard copies of the ordinance, did you distribute, Pam? The, okay. So just for the planning board member, does anybody need um, hard copies of either one? Okay. And, and just for an up, update for planning board members, what, what ordinance is planning to do is continue our public <coughs> hearing on this matter until our July meeting and leave you all your meetings in June to perfect the ordinance because it really this is really something that the planning board is formulating um, it just comes to us for review as ordinance so we're going to continue our public hearing leave you to do your work if you still you have two meetings this month correct so you can finish it off and then we'll have our public hearing continue till our July meeting, and we'll send the finished version of it to us, and then we'll deal with it in July. Um, the one thing we are going to deal with in the public hearing tonight, though, is we, we will close our public portion of the public hearing on the extension of the moratorium, because that's set to run out July 1. So we're going to close our public hearing on that, send it to council so it can get two readings at our second meeting in June so that it's still in place when it runs out. And then we'll wait for you to get back to us with how you finish up with the edits on the proposed zoning change, and then we'll send that to council after our July meeting. Uh, but the moratorium will still be going. So we, we probably won't need moratorium to the end of the year like is in there, but we will need a couple months of it at least. So we'll send it back to you and then we'll fix it out. So we'll throw it to Carolyn to yeah. Tell us about where we are. Sure. So um, the other thing that I just distributed were just pictures um, that we gather from places around the country that show or that are examples of very small um, but distinct park-like features or parks or little little civic spaces. Because one of the issues at the last hearing was, well, you know, how did you come up with 10 square feet and is 10 square feet, I'm sorry, it's 10 square feet per unit, how did you come up with that number, is it too small, um, you know, what number should it be, and so I just um, printed out pictures of very small little pocket parks, if you will, that really would fit into Is there one of these out going around with the public? Um, I don't know. Okay. Um, and so it's really meant to be sort of something that pops um, 
that doesn't necessarily have to be big, but the intent was that, you know, we have examples of these. There are a couple from Northampton that are in here you'll recognize, but also from just, just a, a quick question. Do we have copies of the proposed regulations for the public by any chance? I have extra copies. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Thank you. And then the only addition to these are the changes that weren't totally in there on the projector last month, correct? They were all in the projector, but they had been changed from the original um, So this is a composite to... document? Yes. Okay. Um, so these are... Um, so I have many extra ones because they're ones for URB and ones for URC, but the language is the same, so... Carolyn, the language, the 10 square foot language that there was some discussion about last time, is that, I don't see that in here now. Am I missing something? Yes, it's under four. I had a bullet four for the design criteria. So, um, all projects shall include a common area fully designed and constructed that serves as a focal point of the project, is easily accessible and available. At a minimum, the space shall be 10 square feet of buildable area per dwelling unit, unless a compelling design or smaller size is approved by the planning board, and it is made open to the public and for the public. What, what I got e emailed and I printed up didn't include that language. That's okay, that's strange. <laughs> well, there were then I've got those from three to five. What's that? Yeah, there were some font, there were some number numeric changes, but um, it seems like there were a couple different versions going around, so I apologize for that. But this is um, what was discussed at the last hearing and cleaned up. So I apologize if you got the wrong version emailed. Do you happen to have another hard copy? Yes. Yeah, correct. Yeah, me too. Because mine is obviously the sorry right one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's good. Um, so again, the language really, we didn't make any adjustments to the language from the last public discussion and public hearing that was up on the screen, except for some minor tweaks with, um, you know, tech, text modifications. And I didn't, um, there was a modification, there was actually another text modification that was made um, to, for this copy. I pulled up the wrong copy. We were having tremendous computer problems today, all day at City Hall. And so I think I grabbed the one that didn't have this one minor edit, so I just hand scrolled, uh, scrolled it in for this piece. But it was, it was a typo, so um, it wasn't a um, significant or substantive change. Um, so I think, you know, there's been, so I guess I'd uh, point out that those two, sort of the park issue and the, um, and I know there's a lot of discussion about um, potentially some of the vagueness and the appropriateness of the environmental standards and the um, affordability standards um, and there had been some um, <coughs> sort of follow-up to try to figure out what impact that might have. I think, um, um, Alan, you have concerns about it, um, the conflict in those two items and perhaps one trumping the other in terms of ability. So if we're creating this really difficult standard for energy efficiency, does that then sort of detract from the goal of trying to make these units affordable? Um, so we had attempted to um, try to look at some of that market data to see what, you know, what really would, you know, what the trigger point was, was what was the threshold for doing that, um, and whether it made sense to have one or both. And Councillor, I don't know if you had any follow-up conversations with, um, about that, or if your what your um, feelings are relative to on that, that on that section. Yeah. Um, well, as you recall, originally we were looking at a pick list of four items, two of which were environmental standards and two of which were affordable housing standards. And um, I suggested we group them into two and say that you must meet both an environmental and 
an affordable housing standard if you're building a large development. Um, and to me, either you need to satisfy one of the, the sub. Um, I, I still feel the same way. I think it's important that we have uh, rigorous standards on large developments that come into Northampton. Um, I'm open to exploring the data or possible drawbacks, but I think it's important that we, we make these uh, regulations as, as strict as possible while being there. Um, I did find a, a study that was done by HUD that um, showed that uh, to make a, a affordable housing green, that it would be about 3,500 per unit. Would be that you could make, you could get to a, you could you could uh, follow a green building standard, uh, and it would increase the cost of a unit by about thirty five hundred, and that was for affordable housing. So that's subsidized affordable housing, where you're typically going to have probably several sources of grant financing. And well, the construction costs would yeah. be about thirty five hundred. Right. There must be green and green and green. Exactly. And set, mm -hmm. I mean, does that conform to the specs in the proposed um, ordinance? Well, it would certainly, I think the HERS rating would, 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 could apply to that, where you're just you're building a really high energy efficient, low uh, resource use uh, unit. Yeah, I don't have any idea what 41 or gold. Uh, uh, I don't know what any of that means. So. Well, I mean, under the, 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 for the HERS rating, it certainly is pushing beyond what our stretch code currently is, but the stretch code is also um, on, in flux now. There's a, it will, the, the standard is going to drop. Um, I think Wayne mentioned at the last hearing that um, the building commissioner sort of did a quick review of all the building permits in Northampton. And, um, and I'm going to get the number wrong. It's not that there was an average just over this, like around 45, anywhere between 45 and 50 if all the homes. And that in, that's um, without PV panels. So to the extent that you can put um, photovoltaic arrays on a building or on a parcel, you're going to bring that down. Um, Pretty significantly, or in one, you know, big chunk, as opposed to one point or two points. Um, so higher is better or lower? Lower is better. better. So I'd also like to play yeah. just the affordable housing piece. I think it's important that um, you know under Chapter 40B we need to maintain 10% affordable housing stock in Northampton, or else a lot of the zoning rules that we are creating can easily be disregarded by developers, especially in this case of large units. So I realize that the affordable housing requirement, uh, depending on what it is, can add cost. But it's important to maintain, it's important on principle, but it's also important to maintain the integrity of our zoning. Right, and I think the 10% is a, is a good number, and that was lower when we divided those two, the environmental standard and the housing um, affordability standard. Um, um, from 15% and also the um, 1,200 square foot um, unit. So, um, but I think sort of just going back to the LEED standard and for anyone who's doing subsidized housing now, there's there are more and more uh, requirements from the funders to incorporate um, green measures or go for some kind of LEED certification. So it's not really... Um, you know, those funding sources are pushing for that anyway. So if you're going to be doing um, subsidized affordable housing, you're going to be having to meet some standards anyway that are above and beyond what potentially a typical housing development would um, be reaching for. So, um, and the gold standard, all, again, sort of to describe that, it's not that you meet one thing. Again, it's sort of a pick list to get to gold. You have these you know, pages and pages of options of what things that you can um, um, incorporate into your structure and your site that would give you points towards gold, and gold isn't the highest level. So um, it really gives, there's flexibility there. I think the biggest complaint that we've heard really is the cost of having that third party review and getting a certification as opposed to 
meeting that goal of new goals. I did have a question on the affordable part of it. So you sent out an attachment that said uh, uh, that it gave, um, it identified what the income would be for affordable housing uh, to be eligible for, but it didn't speak to what uh, calculation for rents and sale prices. So where's that piece in it all? Well, so that obviously changes. Um, uh, you know, every year there's there's modification to that based on you know what's happening in the, in the economy. Um, but we have, and I, and that reminds me too. I wanted to follow up. The other ordinances before you tonight for public hearing is the definitional change in our zoning for what affordable housing is, and um, that is sort of important. It goes part and parcel with this because we've always had. Um, a, a definition for what affordable is to meet 80% of the area median income for families, and it's based, there are different family structures that you, um, that are targeted, so depending on the type of housing you're, you're um, designing for, you know, if it's a, um, it's a, for families of four, families of three, families of two, or, um, and depending on the number of um, income earners in the household. But um, we always had a, an across-the-board 99-year restriction. So that if you're building affordable housing, it has to be affordable for 99 years. And that seemed to be a big um, stumbling block for folks who were building affordable housing because the standard funding sources are for 30 years. Um, and um, typically the restrictions, I should say, are for 30 year, 30 year restrictions. So our zoning went well, well beyond that. Um, and for rental housing, so if there's an entity um, that's going to be renting a project and they're going to be the permanent sort of long-term owners, 99 years is no problem because they're in it for the long haul. Their, their mission, if they're you know, like a Valley CDC, they're going to be there, they're going to be renting out. 99 years is not an issue, but for home ownership units, that's where it really is a problem. So, um, I, I, looking at that um, I, I, and comparing that to the restriction or the requirement that these units be, you know, 25 percent or 10 percent of the units meet the definition of affordability, seemed like um, a more onerous um, requirement. But for if you change and alter the definition and allow homeownership units to have a different time period, that that seems to relieve some of that pressure. Um, so, but I don't have a figure specifically about what it is for, but you're, the standard is you're not paying more than 30% of your income for housing. Um, and so you have to meet these criteria, you have to go through typically a lottery system to get in, to be eligible to rent or to purchase these units. Um, so, you know, but beyond having a specific number for 2014. That's the general right, question. Right, so it's 30 percent of of a household income of someone that's earning 8 percent of the income. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. I've got two questions from the previous meeting. Um, it came up in that meeting we discussed a connection from the dead end that might be landlocked, so to speak, that there's no way to connect to a public way because it goes in, it's 500 feet, and it's surrounded by private property, so there's no way to connect to anything. What happened with that? Um, so, um, there was, we changed the wording from um, connection from a dead end street to a street as opposed to, so just to clarify that it's... Is that where the of or or left from a dead end street to, to a street? common area park or civic space. Right, right. So at the end of 500 feet, you have to have a park or connect to a, a public way. Right, right. That's how that goes. Just, just like yeah. street. Right. Anywhere on the way. Well, that, that's what I was saying. Originally, it read from the dead end, and we made a dead end street. Right. So, correct? so therefore, it can be anywhere on the street itself. Right. Okay. 
And then the other one was connecting, in the next one, connecting sidewalks to sidewalks along adjacent streets. Let's assume it's a street that doesn't have a sidewalk at all. I mean, to what extent do we have to go connect to the nearest public sidewalk? Um, well... You don't think <coughs> Henry Street doesn't have a sidewalk, does it? No. no. So if somebody has one of these on Henry Street and they build themselves a sidewalk in a, a five, a five hundred foot dead end street, do they have to go around to Ockham Road to connect to, to a sidewalk or can they just end at the street? Um, well, there is the option in here of, of either separate sidewalks or the shared, the shared street. The shared street. Okay. Correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. it doesn't seem like. Right, well, in item two, um, the design standard two, all projects shall be oriented, connect, and relate to the street, including making streetscape improvements between the property and the road pavement pedestrian friendly and in compliance with city standards. And that piece was about restructuring um, the, the public space or where that sidewalk would be in front of the street. Um, we have, for other projects, um, the board consistently requires new sidewalks to be installed for along that property frontage so that as development occurs, they eventually will connect. And sometimes you're creating orphan sidewalks, but eventually they would connect. So um, to the extent that it's the developer's property, <coughs> right? And even though they would be put in and connect to no <coughs> right. anticipating future sidewalks. And it could be that, you know, there, there's also this whole other off-site traffic mitigation requirement that some of that could be extended beyond the property if it made sense in that situation, you know, and if there were public right of way to do that. So you could have that offset. So a condition on the developer could be that they start building the city sidewalks to connect to other places? If there's off-street mitigation required, so, I mean, off-site traffic mitigation required, we certainly do require, we certainly have, We'd much rather have those things be constructed as opposed to, to having an applicant make a payment in lieu of traffic mitigation. So you could offset your traffic mitigation by making improvements to the network that would or could include sidewalks. And that's consistent with how projects have been built out in, um, throughout the city. And I think the spirit of it is, is beyond sidewalks, it's just the idea that you don't want to create insular developments right that, that feels feel cut off from the city and pedestrians feel like they can't enter and so on right so that there's that transition larger. space between the public and private realm Alan, can you I, I, just, I don't understand in paragraph three how a driveway or roadway can be focused on pedestrians and bicyclists um, well, it's it's um, a shared street. A shared street is the concept of you're incorporating um, a space that would accommodate all forms of, of movement. So it could be vehicular movement, it could be pedestrians, it could be bicycling. And so it has to be designed at a slow enough speed so it's not just for automobiles and they can dip in and out of these driveways. Um, so you could either have a separate sidewalk so it accommodates the um, pedestrians and other users besides non vehicular users, or you could have um, a driveway where all of those things are accommodated, but in a way that the traffic, the vehicular traffic volumes are very slow, so uh, to create a safe environment for all those. Caroline, is that really designed for very small I mean, that's what you're apt to find in very small uh, projects. The larger the projects, the more you're apt to end up with separation. Right, typically, or you'd be also building a street under right. a subdivision exactly. standard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in which we also are working towards creating a design for that kind of system, right. but there's very specific design characteristics that are required. Mm -hmm. But this is really more intended for the smallish, smaller end of that. I think it's probably it might be a simpler it would it's a simpler system so for smaller that would make sense but you could design it yeah. for something that would be bigger. 
Is it, I'm struggling though whether a driveway and roadway can be focused on pedestrians and bikes, I suppose. I mean, what about the, what about the car? The drive on it? There are designs, and you, I don't know if you recall from our discussion about subdivision rule changes or if you came on just after that, but we've been talking about um, creating roadway standards that are for both, that don't have a separated curb and sidewalk system, but have a shared um, access path, essentially. And it's designed in a way that really fits the geometry forces cars to go very slowly so that there would be very little conflict between um, pedestrians and other users of the of the street. It's sort of like, I mean, there are streets in Northampton that exist that are smaller, shorter streets that are, that are no sidewalks um, on the street, but cars drive down, people walk in the street at the same time that cars are driving. They weren't designed to be, um, you know, slow speeds at 15 miles an hour, but that they they do function that way. Um, you know, there are, there are whole neighborhoods in Leeds that don't have any sidewalks on either side, and um, people walk in the street, and cars go slowly because they know that people are walking in the street. It might just be, I think the word focused is, it might be thrown off. Maybe you could say something like the Lucy Mountain engineered to accommodate pedestrians and, bike and bicyclists versus focus, I guess that's the... Yeah, to me, that seems it's just to kind of a strange. raise the question or confuse right. it. I, I don't know if that language focus on pedestrians and bicyclists okay. adds anything, except in my mind, confusion. Okay. I think the idea is every time someone builds a street, it's always about cars. And, we're, and the idea is to shift that and say, well, there are a lot of other users to the net, on the network. And so you almost have to force people to think about those other users in order to get it right. Um, so instead of saying accommodating other users, it's really saying, well, think about the, all the users at once and design it for all of them. So maybe it, it focused on, you know, maybe, that maybe a better way to say it or clear, I don't know, is to say, that it um, is designed for all users equally or something like that, as opposed to focusing on pedestrians. I kind of like the word focus, partly because we're talking about a URB district. So we're talking about a denser urban, you know, we're not talking about something that's so far flung that, you know, it's, I kind of think it really speaks to the new model of thinking of a street not as a street just for ours. You know, it does kind of flip everything, and, you know, sort of, let, let me know when we've been around enough to get some public comment. That's what I think we ought to do. Yeah. And Carolyn, we, we can come back and, deba and debate it, but I think for the... So, for Carolyn kind of explained where we are now, yeah. so um, if anyone from the public wants to come up and comment at this point on this, please feel free to... And so we don't have to open public hearings, but we are continuing to find the one that I do. Yeah. Um, so does anybody want to just come up and just identify yourself for the viewers at home? And, uh, and we'll take your comment. This is on delayed broadcast, though. You're not live. What's that? You're not live. Oh, thank God. This is, you're not live. <laughs> to us, you're live. I, I could do some home. heavy editing no matter where I talk and what I talk. Um, introduce yourself. Mike Kirby, uh, 134 North Street. Uh, the first thing is I'm a little confused about the timing of this moratorium. We're talking about, you explained, I think, the procedure, but uh, essentially it's, it's going to, the moratorium is going to extend until December? It's currently scheduled to run out July 1. Okay. And it's going to take us a little longer to complete the changes to this ordinance. So the, the extension would be to the end of the year. Um, yeah. But we suspect that will be done before the end of the year. Okay. And we just don't want, we're not going to be done for July 1, so we don't want the moratorium to run out before we're done. Okay, good. Yeah. So the public will know 
will public will have one more chance? Um, is there will be a... Well, the planning board meets, what, twice this month? Right. And then council will discuss it. Twice. And then, yeah, so you're going to... Our goal is the ordinance committee will get the finished product from the planning board for our meeting on July 14th. So planning board will discuss it until the 14th. Then we'll discuss it and theoretically end our public hearing and send it to council on the 14th. So the ordinance committee plans another public hearing, one more public on hearing. On the 14th. Okay. Yeah, but not on the moratorium. No, the moratorium right. we're going to do tonight. Okay. Because we need to do it tonight and do two readings at the next council to have it still be a moratorium. Okay. But the, the base ordinance changes seven or more. We'll see two more planning board visitations and then the ordinance committee and then, go, and then go to council. It, uh, there's a couple things that I want to comment on. One of them is somebody had the sensible suggestion that the hardest impact of change like this in an existing neighborhood has to do with headlights at night. Um, from when you have a, a new parking area and a new development kind of shoehorned in on a relatively narrow lot, which I think is what we're talking about, relatively narrow lots, a lot of them, that the headlights shine in your kitchen window at night, you know. And essentially, I was kind of hoping to see in this some kind of uh, encouragement, and maybe it's in here, of planning buffers, vegetation, like it's written into the ordinance that derives, I think, when you change the zones, like when URA meets URB or URB meets, there has to be buffers, vegetative buffers between the zones. I could be wrong. That, that is incorporated in this change. It's on the last page of that ordinance. It's on the last page, so, so there is... And it's not just for the seven plus units, it's for all units that all the, it, it's incorporated to the design standards that apply to any new construction over 2,000 square feet. Okay, good. That puts my mind so many of these. Um, I need to leap to take credit for it, though, because you're my constituent. What? I need to, I need to leap in to, to take credit because you're my constituent. This is something this is that a came change up. To Councilor Donald. <laughs> this is something that came up at the, the zoning forum. Right. 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 And so this was this was put in. And you put it in there. Before the last uh, public hearing. And you're so, my counselor. You know, in case there's any doubt. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Okay, I'm sorry to, to uh, add that. Uh, well, better okay. to ask than be sorry. Huh? Better to ask than be sorry. <laughs> uh, anybody else have any questions with regards to what we've been discussing or comments you want to make in general about the process? Or you all just here to keep an eye on us? <laughs> Please come up. Just come up and tell us your name and address for the folks at home. And okay. Okay. Um, my name is Jane Potter. Uh, 42 Phillips Place, and I just had one question. I thought you had said last time, and maybe I was mis uh, misunderstood, that you were not going to try to put this through in the summer just because so many people aren't around. Well, Did we, that change? The, um, the, the likely timetable, um, if ordinance doesn't get done with it till the 14th of July, then it's probably not going to show up back to council because our, our July meeting will have already happened. So it might, the earliest that we get a first reading would be in August and then it would be on the agenda in September for people when they get back. Okay. So it's, there's no way with, with the current timetable that it's going to, it may hit council in August, but it needs two readings, so it would also hit council in September. Okay. So that we well, get this. And clarify, there are two different streams here. One right. is the stream right. on the moratorium, right. and the other is the revised zoning. Right. Okay. Right. I understand that. Um, well, my comment would be that I really appreciate that you're taking the time to look at this again, given that it's so important. Um, I think we heard from you, um, Chairman Murphy, last time that zoning has not been changed in this town since the 1970s. And I would um, 
respectfully uh, also request that the smaller unit zoning be examined as well, um, just to make sure that we have the clarity of language and that people have really had the chance to pay attention to other studies. I have a, um, a study that I'll be happy to leave with you uh, on planning for all small cities in Oregon, and I was particularly impressed with the way that they indicated that every single there was such transparency in this procedure, and every single um, person who could be implicated by any of the zoning changes um, in the wards where they were doing this were made aware of everything. Um, I'm a little troubled that many of the people in Ward 3 and possibly Ward 4 think that the zoning is all about the ability to build an in-law apartment in the backyard. And while that's fine, I just I think it would be great if there were a way to let everybody know exactly what's planned. We did a little bit of research um, to determine that for new zoning, both uh, the lesser unit and the um, larger unit that you're, that you're focusing on tonight, um, in URA there would be a total of maximum new units allowed under the zoning of 2,008 units. And in URB there would be, um, I'm sorry, that's 1,004 units, but it would be if you add one unit equals two parking spaces, 2,000 cars. Um, in URB, total number of maximum additional units allowed under new zoning would be 3,258. That's 6,516 cars. Um, in URC, the maximum number of additional units under new zoning would be 1,524, which is 3,048 cars. So um, if you add up just the number of cars in terms of parking issues, that's 8,527 cars which only indicates to me that when you're talking about zoning, it's very, very important to include traffic calming, um, parking issues, flow of traffic, public safety, or any of these places near schools, um, and that the way we go about zoning is just a, a little bit more methodical and clarified in language that doesn't include things like focused or should be or could be, but that really has um, language that's not confusing to anyone. Thank you very much. Any, anyone else? Please, the one that we're going to act, the ordinance is going to act on tonight for sure is the um, moratorium. So if anyone is not in favor of us continuing that moratorium until we finish, please speak up on that one because that one we will act on tonight. Step up. Yeah. No other? And I get to go back to our regular discussion. If anybody, something comes to mind, then wave and we'll call on. On procedure, I'm, well, so at our next planning board meeting, are we going to be discussing? Well, you all would take a vote tonight to decide do you want to continue it to June 12th, which is in three days? You want to continue it, which is fine because that's at, at its, there's no procedural problem with continuing it to your next meeting. Or do you want to wait two more weeks and continue it to the June, I think it's June 26th meeting? Are we having a meeting on the June 26th? I thought that was a question. Um, no, not so far. I mean, yes, we'll, we're, the, there's still a plan. It's not until July that we go to one meeting. I knew, but I thought there was um, an earlier discussion. That's okay. Okay. Well, I hope um, we should have that discussion because I'm not sure. But, <laughs> okay. So, I mean, it probably makes sense to continue it to Thursday. And if you're done with it on Thursday, then you don't have to continue it again. If you're not done with it Thursday, you at least have another option to continue it to um, June 26th. Well, it doesn't make sense to continue it to Thursday. Was so it just gives you an extra time, an extra day? If you're not done with it tonight, you know, an extra day to consider an extra meeting, I should say. Um, so it's just an, it just um, leaves the option to open. And to clarify, we only have one permit for right. Thursday. Right. So uh, in that sense, it makes sense to do that. Um, the other thing about leaving the public hearing open is that people feel compelled to come, and I, I'm. Uh, actually wanting your comments, but I also don't want to drag you out meeting after meeting after meeting. So there, that's right. one thing to consider also. Yeah. Thoughts? I, I'm not 
I guess I'm not sure what's going to be gained by continuing it Thursday in three more days. Uh, just whether we can come to an agreement. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Chair, I'm sorry. You're, we're talking about discussing the content of the zone. Yeah. I mean, you, I guess it depends. You can certainly just continue to discuss it now, or you can decide, well, maybe, you know, move on to the other items, continue this one automatically, and then have more um, detailed discussion on Thursday. It's, a, it's really up to you all what you think might be more appropriate. Could, could we, uh, though, if there's no other discussion on extension of the moratorium, would you mind closing that portion of your public hearing and voting to recommend it? And then we'll do the same and we'll vote to send it to council. We'll get that one out of the way. Okay. Does that make sense? And then we can do two readings at our next meeting and it will be extended before it runs up. Okay. Yeah. Last, anyone want to say anything before we do? Yes. Can I just ask why I don't need to take the... Um, and this is just the moratorium. Yeah, no, it's about the moratorium. I just wondered if um, you had thought about or had any interest in including in the in the unit zoning, um, in this this large unit zoning, anything about reuse? So any properties that already exist, um, I, I, you know, car lots on King Street or anything, if those could be considered um, before we pave over something else or build something else. I'm sorry, I don't understand. Um, so well, you, you, you want it, it? It was just having to do with the zoning um, about which the moratorium is intended tonight. So, so that when you go back to your own um, agenda about looking at the language again, I, I don't remember anything about reuse of existing structures in okay. ability to add more units. Thank you, Jane. This is not something you want to add to the moratorium. No, I, I just, I, I don't know if we'll have another aspect to talk about it, so I just okay, wanted to throw it out as a suggestion. Okay, Sorry. so I'll entertain a motion to post here. So yeah. on, the moratorium. on the moratorium piece of this. Right. Moved by Ann, second. Second. Second by Carla. All in favor? And then the second piece of this is Make a positive to recommendation. To recommend we'll that. Uh, we uh, approve the moratorium to send it to our Thank you, Chess. Second. Second. Um, by John. By John. Okay. All in favor? Moratorium moves to you. Okay. So you want to move to close the public hearing on just the moratorium? Yep, so moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Want to move positive recommendation? I do, I just want to be clear, there are, there are three ordinances <clears throat> that we have in front of us that all have to do with the extension of the moratorium. I, I think only the first one is the one that's actually relevant. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. So I, I move that we make a positive recommendation on, that. on amending yeah, okay. the PG and NH. All right, and I'll second that. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, so we're all, we're going to do a little more housekeeping before we take it back to you. So, we're going to continue our public hearing on uh, 350 section 21 affordable units because that's going to go to Ed Lewis. We'll keep our public hearing open on that until our July 14th meeting. And we're going to ex keep it open on 350 3-4 uh, change conservation of farms, forests, and rivers. We'll keep that open until our July 14th meeting. Right. And then we'll keep 350 G&H going because that's the actual text of the zoning changes that the planning board will have finished and sent to us by that. That's right, yeah. Okay. All right, so we want to make that motion. Okay, so I move we continue the next two, 350G and 350H. And 3521 and 353.4, which would be okay, right. affordable units, which we're also got here. We've got here and uh, mm -hmm. Arms Force Rivers. All right. Yes, those four. Can I? <laughs> So before I didn't, I guess maybe I misunderstood you when you first opened. You opened all these items at the very outset. Okay. Everything that you posted. Okay. Um, so um, I for ourselves, the board, we did. For right, ordinance, so, we did. Okay. So procedurally, I just want to clarify. So the board hasn't taken any 
Planning Board hasn't taken any comment on the affordable housing or the farms, forests, and river. So right. we'll, we can move into that after the board. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, because what we're, we're going to do is we'll wait for you to finish the seven or more. Okay. Make your recommendation on, on the affordable. And we want that to go to our ad loop committee okay. anyway. So yeah. we're not going to act on that tonight. Okay. And we'll just continue the farms, forests, and rivers okay. one as well. Okay. And then it should be all, we, we'll, we can wrap it all up. Okay at our meeting on the 14th yep. and be done with it all and then you guys can work on all that other until then. Okay. Right. So by my reading, our work here is done. Else? Are we done with everything else? The moratorium we set forward and everything yep. else we continue. That's so, that's All right. So, so I'd entertain a motion to adjourn okay. this adjourning ordinance. Planning board is going to stay. Yeah, so all right, I'll second that. Okay. Aye. Aye. <laughs> <laughs> she always do things like that. <laughs> Don't we have to approve you leaving? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, just, just, just a cheer. Okay, so we're going to pick up. You're going to keep, don't, don't leave, folks. They're going to keep talking about it in the planning board. Just, it's just the two of us from ordinance that are leaving because our public hearing is going to last longer are than theirs. Are we captive audience? We, <laughs> we just you want to make sure you stay here long enough for us to get out of town. <laughs> and, and, and then you all will shut off the video equipment, which is still going, and we'll turn the room over to you. Yes. So thank you. Yes, so we have, uh, according to our uh, agenda, we've completed item number two, which was to extend the moratorium. Um, we have started the discussion of, of number one, which is the content of the special permit standard for seven plus units. And that was sort of the language that the discussion we were in when we stopped and had public hearings so that we didn't keep these people here if they wanted to say something and leave. Um, and we've now closed the public hearing, but we're going to keep discussing this and you're welcome to stay and talk us or not. So I don't think there was a motion to close the hearing on the language changes, just to clarify, because you were going to either keep it open and discuss it now, or opt to continue it Thursday. And what about, and what about the five scores? We haven't even opened that. That's that. even open. So at the point we're at right now, we leave the public hearing open on the general discussion. Uh, my reaction to that is I see my advice is to, to leave it open because I'm not sure we're going to finish it tonight. But that's just my that's just my personal thought. Um, I, I have already expressed that I hate to have public hearings running repeatedly because it, it brings people out repeatedly because they just want to make sure that we're not up to anything. Uh, that's, yeah. I, I think that's a good plan. Yeah, but my question would be, have we had a public notice that Thursday there will be? I mean, yeah. do people anticipate that there. No, okay. I didn't post it because no. I have 48 hours to post, which gives me till tomorrow. Okay, well, so that's I wanted to wait to see what the outcome of tonight's okay. meeting was. Yeah, I didn't, want, anything. didn't yeah. want that to be out there, right? So Thursday, there's just that one item on the agenda. Right. Yeah, right. yeah it's um, it's Bancroft Road. Bancroft Road. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I, um, you know, it. There's no, there's no, you know, right way to do this. Right. If you guys feel, if you want to continue to have your conversation here, if there's some things that you want to really delve into and discuss and hammer them out now, that's fine. You can be done with it tonight if you want to, because this was officially, you know, the continuation of the hearing. If, um, you know, so if you can dispense with it tonight, that's fine. If you feel like you can't, then you can go Thursday, whatever. I am, um, so I won't be able to attend Thursday's meeting, and I do have some. some comments that I do want to make about this. Yeah. So good. I can make one down. Okay. Um, so um, on number two where it specifies rain gardens, I just I wanted to know why rain gardens are, are specified. Why that's specific and it wouldn't be more of a best managed best practices for low impact development. Um, or water management. Maybe. In other right. words, you pick one one thing of water right. management. Why that one? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, um, well, it's probably better to have something more generic. So I would agree. We. I think the idea was to give um, specificity about the type of thing that could be appropriate. 
I think um, it's good for us to illustrate what the example is, so say, that it knows, say such it, it knows yeah. so that we know what we're talking about. But mm -hmm. but there are and there will continue to be different creative ways to solve. Uh, That's right. Yeah. Um, so I think that it probably does make sense to say, um, when possible. Um, <coughs> well, we also have this. Um, we could either call it green infrastructure or uh, or, or tech. Yeah, low impact development yeah. is, a, is, a, is a known uh, okay. construction. Uh, and use and, and of low impact design. Um, low impact development. Yeah, and, and uh, I didn't really like uh, okay, so you know so as far as some of the other speakers, the other comments about uh, the base and it also specifies appropriate drainage improvements. Well, it could be necessary um, to comply with standards. So we could just say necessary drainage improvements instead of appropriate. Yeah. Necessary, made necessary by other parts of the ordinance? Or PPW. Um, yes, I mean, we have standards. Whenever you apply, you have to meet stormwater standards. Within a, when you have a site plan approval project, you also have to, you have to comply with uh, various technical requirements. So, Stormwater is one of them. So then it wouldn't have to be stated. Um, no, except that some this is specific to the streetscape area in front of. So if you're making changes to the streetscape, including adding tree belts, it might require you to adjust the drainage that is already there that might be functioning the way it is in its current condition, but with your changes, you might need to um, redirect water in a different way. So mm -hmm. it's not, it's meant to be um, as it relates to those streetscape changes. Mm -hmm. Can we call them applicable drainage improvements for that? <coughs> and they smell, right? <laughs> Yeah. And if there are necessary, it would be good if it were clear. Uh, it just doesn't seem clear to me. Well, I could say, you know, and use of low impact de uh, de uh, development standards um, and necessary drainage improvements. Um, <clears throat> then you can say, such as. Well, then I was you can put say, your rain gardens in it for an example if what you're attempting to do is give people ideas. I don't know what the best is. Yeah, I'm not sure. We should, but So, tree belt the use of low impact development standards and necessary drainage improvements, you know, tr triggered by these changes or something like that. Yeah, the, the, they would be made necessary by the changes that were part of this development. Is right. that right? Right. Okay, so, and use of low, and low impact development standards um, and necessary drainage improvements uh, triggered by these changes. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then just not reference rain gardens at all. Well, I don't know about that. I mean, if, if you wanted to use it as an example, but... Well, I, I, I don't want to be, I don't, I, if we're going to generalize, I don't yeah. want to go back mm -hmm. and specify one thing, uh -huh. right. but not include yeah. the whole laundry list yeah. of options. Right. I mean, yeah. this isn't the only place where somebody is going to get a sense of what they could do. So right. we're, we're going to have a whole conference with you, you know, it right. can come up in lots of other places. Yeah, I mean, so. the developers are going to know. Sure. Right. 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 So, yeah, do with that, the right Okay. Carlo, one more? Uh, let's see. I, I guess I thought number four still had problems, and that's the, the public space. But it might be that I was having trouble, like the other people, and maybe that I wasn't sure which moratorium replacement to look at. I think you sent three in total, or they all kind of vary. Um, Maybe not. Maybe it was just URB and URC. I think that's what the three was in reference to. That plus the extension. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So. 
so on one of them, um, yeah, um, there was some incomplete, like I didn't understand, um, yeah, so I thought four still maybe could be worded Um, the other thing, I don't know if this is what you're getting at, but, um, you know, we talked a lot about whether it should be called a park or a civic space, and Councillor Sewell said park in, in might lead one to believe that it's meant to be public. I don't think I agree with that. I think there are many, many examples of private parks and private park spaces, and I don't know if common area elicits the same you know, is that specific enough for someone to understand what a common area is versus a, a park slash common area? And I actually, I think we discussed internally at the staff level having park slash common area put in, which is not in this version. So I don't know if that, um, if you, you all You're talking about four? Yeah. Put in where? All projects shall include a park slash common area as opposed to just common oh. area. Mm -hmm. Well, it is meant to be outdoor, right? Yes. Yeah. Right. So yeah. I think common area leaves open a lot of interpretation that is it in that it's yeah. not. It's a little meeting exactly. room, you know. Yeah. It's just like, okay. oh, let me, you know, if, yeah. I love to see. Okay. So <laughs> I use open space, uh, um, or just outdoor common area. I mean, something that specifies indoor yeah. versus outdoor. Well, and as long as we're editing. Um, after a project, there needs to be a which is easily so that you just that makes okay. the sentence work and take out the, the comma after accessible because after, if you get the which in there, it'll read so you right. don't need that. Okay. Which is easily accessible and available <coughs> for the project. Okay. And, and this one doesn't have the 10 square foot minimum. Well, the, the problem the is you're looking at the yeah. wrong version. The one we were emailed in. So did you, did I get, so let me give you this part. Okay. I'm sorry, I don't, yeah. I clicked the wrong, I must have clicked the wrong file when I hit, you know, Are you handing out copies of the ordinance? Okay. Yes, yeah, so there was, I, you, did you just come? I just got it from work, I missed yeah. the public hearing part, and I'm just interested in it. And I, I downloaded the prior one, but not any amendments. Carolyn? Yeah. So to your point before, you, the the first sentence says that it would be available for residents of the project, yeah. the of a private park, and then at the end it says open to the public in perpetuity. Well, so that goes with the second sentence that if you want to go below the ten square feet per dwelling unit, then you have to make it available to the public. Um, it's only if you're requiring all the, so if you meet the standard, 10 square feet, then you can't force someone to give land to the city. Okay. But if you're asking for additional permission to go for something beyond that, then the trade-off is, well, you have to make it available to the public, and that is okay, because there is a standard by which you could, you could meet that, and you can do whatever, you know, can be just available to you. Can I ask another, just one more question on item four, just about open, if they do ask for that smaller, uh -huh. if they don't want to meet that 10 first foot standard, um, could the developer then just donate less land, you know, a smaller amount to a land trust and then not be paying taxes on public land? I mean, what, is there a requirement that the developer continue to own and maintain in perpetuity a smaller park? Like if I were that developer, I would just say I don't. If I want less than that, I'm just going to shave off a smaller portion and donate it to someone else to take care of as a part. You know? Yeah. Like how do we prevent a developer? I mean, that would be a terrible. Because the city doesn't have to accept it. Well, for, yeah, right. So the city oh. doesn't have to accept it, but it could also be part. I think that is something that would be part of the whole package and the conversation in front of the planning board for the special permit for creation of seven or more units. Okay. Does it make sense if you're just doing, you know, it ends up being five square feet per unit instead right. of 10. Is that something the city wants? And, and you can specify this is a private park, but open, you know, you need to grant the city an easement essentially, I think would probably be the appropriate, one of the appropriate ways to do it because again, 
if you're if leaving it open to the public doesn't necessarily mean it's owned by the public. Right. Um, and but at the same time, someone could, you know, have some other entity um, manage it. But you'd also have to look at the open space requirements because there is a minimum open space on the parcel that has to be part of the fee simple ownership of that land. You can't gift off. Okay. Open space because then it would detract so from your lot like, area. Yeah, there's a good place. To put yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think even before that, so I know there's a lot of discussion, some discussion among um, amongst board members about the 10 square feet. So I think before we leave four, you all should decide whether you think that's a viable number, it should go up, should go down, or um, be eliminated, or what. Yeah, I do want to hear thoughts on it. I, I know we can't be the first community that's tried to figure out a metric for creating, you know, I mean, there, there, and there are two issues. There is the open space that you, you know, the, the balance between it's under construction or it's left next to it open. And then this, which is a uh, developed element, a small right. developed element, right. and that needs to be maintained. And so I, I get it that, that it's not, we're not talking about all of the park opportunities within a developed area, but that we are asking for them to take some special effort to do some, I don't know, I don't want to call them bling, but you know, some, some, yeah. some useful, attractive things that the community itself would value. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we're trying to get across here. I don't know if 10 square feet, I mean, it sounds very small to me, but I, I think you have done your due diligence and shown us examples both within our town and within other towns where it has done just that. So I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. We're talking here, by and large, not about enormous pieces of property in these. This, these are all small pieces of property. I mean, we, could, we can think, if we're thinking without putting it into that context, we can think about big developments and then you come to the question of size and scale but we're talking about how you try to create some kind of space in what are probably all essentially relatively small pieces of property where you're just trying to maintain some kind of community space right so i have to think we have to keep that in mind when we're mental imaging what this kind of stuff would look at. Like. Right. So the minimum here, you know, this is for seven units or more. Right. So the minimum open space, or this piece of the open space, is 70 square feet right. if you're doing a seven unit project. Right. So, um, and the minimum lot size for a seven <coughs> unit project is probably going to be more than this, but the very ultimate minimum would be 17,500 um, square feet. So we're talking about less than half an acre um, because you're, you need one, you're allowed one unit per 2,500 square feet, but that's only to the extent that you can also fit parking and other design criteria on the lot. So it's probably going to be closer to half an acre as opposed to the 17,000 square feet. So of the half an acre, you also have to permanently protect an open space um, in URC, 30% of that already is just lawn or what have you. Um, landscaping, buffer for the headlights, all of that counts towards open space. So then you, so if a third of that is um, 6,000 square feet that's distributed around the site in trees, landscaping, that kind of thing, then you have the special area, the 70 square feet. That's going to be the minimum. So um, um, for, for a seven year project. And you know, some of these examples I, I think could easily fit that Bill. Yeah. Um, it's a real urban concept. Yeah. I, I thought that the whole, this whole issue arose in the context of this enormous potential development of, on Lyman Road. No, I wouldn't say no. that. I would say we've heard from a lot of people at different times, even going back before um, the ordinance was adopted in September, that a key concern was sort of this loss of open space or this ability of, of also incorporating pocket parks into neighborhoods mm -hmm. as we create infill or as we see little bits of housing get um, added to the urban neighborhoods that, that this concept of um, having a little bit of 
park space um, not be left out. And so certainly during the discussion of the, um, the forum we had specifically on alignment state that that came up, but there's a ton of that land that's going to remain open anyway because it's floodplain. So it's not really just about open space. It's really about having that sort of focus. Blink. Focus. <laughs> that's the say. focus. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and having a place so that people are, are encouraged to connect with each other in the, that developed area, which I think the developer themselves <coughs> are to want. So I don't see this as being a resistant. I just am, we, we've been grappling with what metric is right. And, and we want to put a metric on it, I do, because I, that's, a, that's a quantifiable thing. I know what we're asking at that point. Right. Dan. Right. I think that if you think 70 square feet of what that is, I mean, it's like two desks, maybe over there. It's really enough for about a bench, or maybe two small benches. It just doesn't seem, and it, it, at that point, it seems onerous to me to ask somebody, to have to take, you know, uh, create something like that. There should be some minimum that you can't go below to make it sort of worthwhile. But it's only seven units. I understood. Okay. But so, but you're, so you're taking a seven unit and you're forcing them to, I don't know, it just it seems like a, like it's not worth it and and it's an additional expense that isn't there. So would you, would you think, for instance, that if this were a 15 unit, a 20 unit, a 30 unit area, there'd be some place at which requesting this sort of thing would make more sense than in a 7 unit area? Well, at 20 units, you would have, you know, a little bit more space. It would be, you know, 200 square feet, right? So all of a sudden you're going 20 by 10. That's a, I mean, there's nothing, even this one here, which is a planter and benches. I mean, I look at that, I'm thinking that's 150 to 200 square feet. And that's the smallest one shown here. I just, I have a hard time seeing a 70 square foot being anything that would be worth asking somebody to do. So I'm just, I, I'm not proposing that we eliminate it. I think there should just be a minimum, you know. It should be no less than, the, the least would be a 10 by 15, 150 square feet, or 200 square feet, or 10 okay. foot per unit, whichever is larger. Okay. I, I think that makes sense. Um, but I, in terms of the numbers, I, I don't have a more fundamental problem with this. It's not clear to me why the zoning ordinance should force a developer to include a park for the people who will be buying or renting there. If the developer thinks that makes sense and if the people that they want to sell or rent to demand it, it will happen. And I'm not sure, since we're not talking about an amenity that benefits the broader population or the neighborhood, it's only, I gather, because it says available for residents of the project. I, I don't know why that's a public good. Well, I'll take that one just as a, a devil's advocate sort of thing. So the developer obviously wants to make the most money on project. That is an absolute bottom line. And they are selling these units one by one to people who have no leverage to say, I wish you had put a park in for me. The unit is there, buy it or leave it, somebody else will. So I do think that there are asking for the common good kind of rules, particularly for, you know, when these are these are the best opportunities for a developer at seven or more. But that, that's really yeah. not true how it happens. You go out house shopping, you know, you might see a development that's got a wonderful park over there, and you're going to buy that one because the one over here does not. You know, that's really how it works. It's not that the buyer doesn't have any leverage. He does have leverage. He doesn't have to buy the property. Uh, but I, I think, just to clarify, the idea isn't about making sure that people who are buying it um, feel good about where they live when, if they buy a seven or more unit project. The idea was really to create some relief in the landscape as we're develop as these sites are being in, in infill. And it's not just, you know, you could be walking down the street, it could be your neighborhood, new project, and if you see something, even, you know, glimpsing down the driveway or through the break in the buildings, you see something, 
it um, presents back to the street and the facade. And or if you live next to it and you're on the second floor of your house and you're looking down into a courtyard, that's um, a, a relief, a visual relief on the landscape that was not there before and maybe, you know, helps um, offset the fact that you're um, the lot that was open when you first bought your house is no longer open, even though you have, you know, it's not your land, you have no control over it. So the idea was initially was to create some little pockets of relief within the city and make sure that there were areas left over that every square inch wasn't built out with parking or just leftover grass space. But there's no requirement, as is presently written, that it be visible or beneficial to the community. It could be completely interior and invisible. Uh, that's why I... Well, and that's why I guess that leaves flexibility, because then you can design your site. It would be, you know, the way that it works best for you as the developer. But, yeah, I mean, I, I think wonderful design and color, use of color and um, attractive architecture is a, a important thing, but we're including for the broader community because because the, the architectural details are visible, more visible from the street, but we're not requiring that. I mean, this seems akin to that, that we are requiring. It, it seems like we're trying to accomplish something that's not being accomplished, or that the zoning ordinance shouldn't appropriately be trying to do. It's only for the people who live in the development, and it's not as written going to accomplish anything for anyone outside of it. And unless, as you described, it happens to turn out to be visible for it. Right. Well, I think that's sort of where the, the, um, there's some inherent, um, you know, rules that have to be that, you know, the city or any public entity can't, you know, overstep bounds, is that we want to make sure that there are these spaces there, but we want to clarify it's really intended for the property and the people who live there because we as a city can't force someone to give that land or to make it beneficial for the public. But the idea that you're still creating these pockets that may or may not be um, visually accessible to the rest of the city um, it still has its inherent benefit, and, and it's a response to what we heard um, many times through the public hearing process about how to address and offset some of the concerns about infill development. I guess, and I think in many ways I agree with Alan's perspective that it seems like we're trying to do something without trying to do it in a sense, that we're trying to say that we want infill and we want all these things, but we want it this way. I, I don't know, to me it seems like we're being more directive than we typically are, that we're delving into architectural and, and other issues that I think we typically don't, you know, beyond standards and things like that. You know, we couldn't tell the Smith architect how to design their dorm, but I, I don't know, this. Well, to me, it feels like we're trying, we're, we're, I don't know that we're going over that line, but we're treading yeah. very close. Again, and I agree, on something that may have no impact, not be visual, anything to the public at all. Uh, and we're telling this developer, you got to put in this space. Well, remember where this came from. Originally, there was no special yeah. permit for no matter what number of units you did. In fact, in urban residential C, up until September, there was no special permit required for any number of units, it was site plan only. So when city council decided to address concerns that were raised, for the most part by few Ward 3 residents, about how we still need to have more control over larger projects, there was a permit, special permit threshold put in. So this is just for those projects that kick in a special permit. And with special permit, there was a, a strong desire to have more specificity about design standards and more control over what these things look like, what they felt like, how they functioned within the neighborhoods. So because you're in a special permit realm is like a whole different right. space. 
Um, I don't. I, I don't. I guess I agree with that aspect. This just seems like one. <coughs> to me, one step, maybe too far. You know, it has to be the focal point of the development. I mean, I, it just feels like we're being a little too. I like the fact that it would be come before us because it's a special permit because of the size, but I don't know. Something about this particular clause, I, I don't know, it just feels like we're going a little bit too far. I don't know, that's just my own. Yeah. Okay. Is, um, you raise an interesting point about the term focal point because, you know, I haven't been part of your discussion on this you know, until now, but I think it's a very interesting point to raise to say that a development of seven years or more, that we're not just saying that it's going to be dwellings. The other important things are open space and constructed exterior space. And I think it's okay for us to say that, but maybe maybe focal point is the issue. You know, I mean, with regard to size, I think, I hear what you're saying about the small size of it, but as somebody who lives downtown, 70 square feet <laughs> would be, we'd love it. I mean, I, you know, if my building were being constructed now, which it couldn't, but, you know, we're eight residential, five commercial in a mixed-use building, we have zero open space, zero green space, you know, we don't have anything. And we're talking about districts that are more urban, that, you know, we're not talking about a Ryan Road development of seven years or more, right? So, you know, it seems, I like your idea of kind of 10 square feet per unit or, you know, this 100 square feet in total, whichever is larger, you know, potentially, but, you know, it seems, I think it's relevant, I think it's interesting, I think it also kind of changes the way that we characterize development, that it's not just places where people are going to go to sleep at night, that it's, you know, all of these different things taken together, that constructed open space is important for livability, we know that, open space is important for energy, sustain, you know, a variety of environmental concerns, um, but maybe, you know, maybe it's that focal point term that, that begins to have that design consideration, you know, I don't know. I mean, well, I, I, my, from my memory, this is developers will. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, we asked for a bike rack and it got put on the back side of the building, away from the doors. We, I think about the park on uh, uh, on Village Hill that it's the least developable lot that had to be set aside for a fountain. So I mean, I am looking. I understand that to me that's what focal point is, and it sort of addresses Alan's concern of. Well, you know, a, a bed of flowers behind the building, it might meet the bill yeah. kind of thing. So something that's very, it's got to be very integrated into the overall development. That, that may not be the best word, but I mean, I think that's what we're trying to but say is you sense. can't just check the box by right. putting it, you know, in the back corner. Next to the dumpster. Next to the yeah, dumpster. Next to the dumpster. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we've come a long way on that. I like the 10 square feet and and a minimum because that says, you know, you're going to have to, you're going to have to, know what you're dealing with and then if it gets bigger, if the project is bigger, you have to address it and design for it. I think we'll clearly have to design to it. And, and, and your comment is right. Maybe they did say something like that is fully integrated into the project. I mean just yeah. so that instead of, again, I don't know why it is, but that word focal just seems, but if it was more, you know, it's clearly part of the plan. Fully it's not, yeah. oh yeah, we had to do this and you know, we, it was the last thing on our punch list. And, and we've seen that, and we know what that looks like when it's when it is the last thing stuck on. Right. If it's you know a fully integrated into the plan, then I, I think uh, I, I would it would be more amenable, I guess, to me just uh, as a it would be a little less directive, a little more. We'd like to really you know we'd like to let you be creative, mm -hmm. but you know we want to see you kind of around these plans. Well, and I don't know if it's worth bringing up, but one thing about the park is that it, it, as a concept is that it's on the through fare, it's, it's on the traffic way, it's on the cow path, if you would, which is another, I'm not sure how to word that, but it's an effort to try not to let you just deal with it so easily somewhere else. Although there can be some quite It really depends upon what the nature of the yeah, piece of quite property is. Well, I, yeah. I don't know, I think integrated means it's not off the beaten path. Uh, right. I mean, that would be my interpretation. Yeah. Yeah. Unless they could, they could come yeah. and, uh, the designer could come and, and prove that by locating it like in the rear of the property, it's a meditative space. Right. Yeah. You know, but again, we'll have special permits, so we right. can really take that. Right. Or there's a hill or a creek in mm -hmm. some place that you're yeah. working with. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. But I, I, I don't, I, I don't think, I think it's very much in our purview. I don't see it that much different than, you know, we have an open space requirement. 
So I agree. I, right. okay. I agree. So I heard. Does Carla have another? <laughs> oh, wait, before we go to that, so 150 square feet, 100 square feet, or 10 square feet per unit, whichever is greater. You know, I'm with you. I mean, I think you know, 70 square feet. You could get a great place to hang out. Um, and it, and it particularly keeps it for a small, and it keeps it clean. For you know, two it's, it's it's it's. They have seven units. That's right. household. Yeah. So we have one to two people each. That's yeah. you know, that's eight percent of people at any given time, which is not. It's pretty good. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I I think the metric will be a stumbling block in discussions it is. as it continues mm -hmm. to go forward. I, I do think there's some value in setting sort of a, uh, a usable space. And I don't know, 10 by 10, 100, 150, I think it's all debatable, but I'm liking the discussion leading towards uh, a, 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 at some point it's too small to really serve its purpose. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, though, as you did, on, just to be the devil's advocate, the other side of that is that's 70 or whatever square feet of economically viable space to that developer in, you know, especially in or, you know, every square foot is worth yeah. something. Right. So, I mean, you know, that's, the, I mean, that's the other side of it. Probably and the more, value to the unit. Yeah, well, yeah. right, yeah. So, yeah, so, pay more for yeah, so okay. well, and, you know, we, there's the flip side of this whole discussion, which is for the longest time as we were talking about King Street, the lack of development there was laid on the zoning and having not had the right rules to create the business opportunity. So, you know, that speaks yeah. to your concern. It's a fine line to walk between wanting to get the development right and wanting it to happen. I guess my thought, though, is on King's, I wasn't part of any of that discussion, but it had to do with the impact on the front of the development that the public sees. And my problem with this is that it may have nothing to do with the public at all which makes me wonder why we're doing it. But it may. You yeah, know, it, can, no, it can hit the mark more, more times than not. Um, yeah, I kind of mm -hmm. hear Carolyn talking about all the public hearing comments that we've yep. been through and what people are yeah. asking for. And Lyman, I sat through that one. They clearly wanted yep. some some areas that, that those are, that's the neighborhood envisioning their own ability to see breaks in the, in the architecture. I know that. Yeah. But we've already been told by the solicitor you can't yeah. you can't make them give you a part, really. You have to say it's their part. I just had a question, uh, my last one about this, and that's um, if they're allowed to come without fully developed engineered plans and, and they're asking for approval without that, then is there a second review when the engineered plans are complete, and is it reviewed by the board, or does it just go to the city, you know, uh, offices like DPW and things like that? So the last, so that's a really good question. Um, the last paragraph is meant to address that in that item. In any special permit approval granted with only preliminary site plan, the board may establish thresholds in which amendment of that special permit is required either prior to or in parallel with review of the fully engineered site plan. But whose review of the fully engineered plan? The board, planning board. Oh, okay. It's meant so to be a planning board approval, but that you just don't have to do the full site plan when you come for special permits. So that's the biggest issue for applicants is oh. if they know they have to get a special permit, that's a really iffy situation, right. and they don't want to spend all that money on mm -hmm. plans mm -hmm. and then be told you don't get your special permit. So this is sort of a preliminary check. So Can I get my special permit? And then if the answer is yes, okay, fine. I'll spend all the money I need to on the engineer plans. And they come back for site review. And they come back for site review, but so that we don't have a repeat of Village Hill, you can write in specificity about, well, if you don't do X, that will require a whole new analysis of special permit. So in your preliminary special permit, you could say, these are the things that are essential to us approving your special permit. Mm -hmm. So don't take those away, essentially. We, or you have to come back for an amendment if you take those away. And then you don't get into this sort of gray area about whether or not well, And I think we ought to be reminded of that when when that situation arises. Yes. That those are the hooks and, and, and the line items that we want on reviewing the soft 
design, if you would, before before you're going to do the the DPW looks at your stormwater plan. Mm -hmm. I I can see the practicality of it, but yeah. I I felt burned by Village Hills mm -hmm. Village, mm -hmm. and so it's that sort of thing. The the, the, the general plan didn't get built out the same way. But, but I could add at the end to clarify, in parallel I would review the fully engineered plan by the board. Yeah, that answers your question. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's great. Does anyone feel like continuing the rest of the discussion for Thursday? Mm -hmm. I would entertain the dinner time motion if you want. If you think we can get mm -hmm. through it, I would also entertain <laughs> staying. So it's a, I, I think that's truly where you can vote on whether you want to stay in. What else? Can we maybe try to set knock off maybe one or two more tonight or something like that? And then, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I... And so you're saying leaving this but then addressing the FFR and the affordable no. housing or pushing everything to Oh, you know, just maybe... And, and it just might make sense to go one at a time and just, you know, we're kind of bouncing around here. I'll be um, happy to do that. And I'll just go down through. and see if there's any discussion. And okay, so um, we're looking at the hard copy that Carolyn handed out tonight. It kind of sounds like there is some consensus on four, though. I'm feeling that anyone's on four. Let's go back. Just to throw in something to generate more discussion. Um, I mean, would it be, you know, a lot of the debate was about whether or not it would be publicly viewable or accessible, and why can't we just require that? That it not necessarily be publicly accessible, but viewable, so that the, that the pocket part has to be seen. I don't know if I agree with that. that makes I think that's pushing the design too much. I think it's in the solicitor's guidance to us is where I think it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have words on, I don't need that to answer um, that, can you? Yeah, I think um, that might be slipping over to the, um, so the, to the exaction mode that we don't have jurisdiction to do. I mean, I'd be happy to check, but my sense would be that we, that um, we couldn't require that. That would be viewable. Right. Okay, I'm going to start and go through section by section, just to feel like we've gotten some structure to this. Um, <clears throat> we've already got the criteria for site plan approval. There's no question to that one, is there? Okay, special permit approval required. Um, Where are you? I'm just on page one. Page one, two. Um, and, and I'm marching through the introduction, I'm pointing us to number one, says first row of buildings along the street. And we made those changes. We made the to changes two. to two already. Yep. Okay. Number three has to be the sort of discussion that we had when Councillor Murphy was here about the sidewalks and the connectability. And the word focus. Yeah, I didn't hear any consensus about that. Do you want to discuss? Yeah, let's talk about that then. The, um, I, I thought, Alan, maybe it was bothering you that, about the cars because I, I think we're just assuming streets are going to be designed for cars and that's what we're well, trying to... I can see both, but this seems to be that they're primarily for pedestrians, not for cars, even, which I don't understand, even though they're driveways and roadways. You know, what if the pedestrian walks right down the middle and says, hey, car, it's focused on me. You go somewhere else. My experience is they lose those battles, but that's my business. <laughs> um, well, why, why couldn't you just, if you just took out, you know, or be designed as shared streets and then took out focused on pedestrians and bikers and the, that's... For the and, use of... And, 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 and then left in, engineered to keep speeds below... Yeah, right. Well, yeah, that right. would accomplish the objective without... Can you focus uh, on bicycle and pedestrian safety? Um, you know, we're going to have a definition of shared streets that this is going to fall back to from the subdivision rules, so we could drop out shared, you know, leave it at shared streets, 
and engineered to keep speeds below 15. Okay. Um, because there will be a definition. Of what that means. And when you go look, that's what it's going to say. It's pedestrian, bikes, <laughs> and car. So you guys can debate that when we bring the subdivision ranks in. All right. Um, any, uh, any other comments about three and connectivity? So you're, you're taking the words out, focused on pedestrians and bicycles? Yeah. No, no. So I feel better having that in. I think that is the point, but that's just that's. But the next world. sentence doesn't make sense because there is no such thing as such sidewalks in the. Oh, separated sidewalks. Yeah, yeah. There, was a, never mind. Yeah. there is. Uh, I think it helps to remove focus. I do too. And, and one suggestion was shared streets for the use of pedestrians yeah. and bicycles yeah. along with right. cars if you yeah. want to put that yeah. in Yeah, or design the shared streets with pedestrians yeah. and bicycles. Okay. All right, put that back in. Head the mic to go back in. I'll risk a revisit to number four. Well, Becky, can we back up just a second yeah. uh, to two? The question that David Murphy raised, uh, what was that? I mean, uh, by now, so if it's a dead end, it's dead end primarily, I assume, or most often because there's no street to connect to. At the end. At the end. Or, at, yeah, anywhere along the dead. If, they, if, if the developer could connect to an existing street, they would do it, I, I assume. Mm -hmm. I don't so, assume that. No. No, I think right. people love to buy on dead end streets and developers like to build on them yeah. if they could. That's very well so share. But but there has to be how how the, how does how do they get access mm -hmm. to land to put a bicycle on connection pedestrian connection to the to another street? <coughs> I guess if they can't they don't develop that piece of land. Or they design it in a different way, or they don't create it in the street. Don't say that again. So, um, it, then maybe the dead end, maybe a dead end street isn't the appropriate design for that parcel if they can't make another connection to a street or an open space. And that's been very consistent with the way the board has reviewed subdivision um, applications as well. That um, new streets shouldn't just connect, uh, just not be disconnected from the rest of the so network. dead end streets in general without connection to other streets are frowned on. Right. There's strong disincentives to create any new ones for those. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess this accomplishes that. So, uh, we've done three. Revisiting four, any last thoughts on that? I think we made the corrections that we'll, we'll see next round. Five, buildings that abut existing residential property shall incorporate building articulation and well-designed side facades, and that's to keep the new development from giving you a full brick wall. Building projections shall be incorporated for any side facade that is longer than 30 feet. What does that mean? Building projections. It, 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 both of those sentences to me say we're we're telling you that not to give us a solid brick wall. A flat facade. So you have to either have offsets, right. a little outset, something that's just not right. perfectly yeah. flat. Yeah, I haven't heard any comments negative to that one. Number six, building facades shall have similar setbacks to other buildings in the area that or provide a different setback with a setback that is consistent with the location, either closer setbacks in more urban areas or different setbacks because of natural resource constraints. Does location mean zone in this case? Or is it um, big broad? No, um, city neighborhood. Site. Neighborhood, yeah. okay. So you could, you could be building next to a non-conforming structure and might have a very good reason for making a pitch to us mm -hmm. that you um, do something different than the, most of the neighborhood. And this would be our reason for thinking that. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Uh, number seven, the design standards for the length of building <coughs> streets, projection of natural features, sidewalks, wheelchair ramps, landscaping utilities, and it's not meant to be a broken paragraph. And it shouldn't be a capital P. And the construction yeah. methods and materials for water lines, sanitary sewers, storm sewers, fire protection, sidewalks, private roads, and other infrastructure shall be those set forth in Chapter 290 subdivision, even for private roadways and driveways that are not part of the subdivision unless the planning board finds a different standard more appropriate. Driveways or private roads shall be designed to function as private alleys, shared streets, or yield streets, as shown within in the subdivision regulations. So that's the addition. So are private alleys, is that defined somewhere? In the subdivision regs that will be adopted by you shortly. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we better adopt it. <laughs> Or change the language. Um, Carolyn, you've obviously added the last sentence there. Can you remember what part of the driver for that was? The last part of that? Driveways or private roads? Oh, because we that's what the discussion we wanted to clear. So um, instead of specifying all the definitions of those types of different functional access ways, you know, the driveways or streets, that just refer to the same standard um, in the subdivision regs. Okay. Comments? What does that mean? I don't understand. Them. What does that mean, designed to function as a private alley? Yeah, I don't understand that at all. Um, so, in because we have uh, because we have to specify street systems in the subdivision rules and not somewhere else. We have a whole definition of streets now in our subdivision rules, and so what we've been talking about over the course of the last six months is completely changing the definitions of streets and what they are. So um, a private alleys function in a different way and serve different, um, um, well, potentially uses, but serve different needs than a shared street. They're narrower, they're probably one way. Um, well, they are typically one way, and they don't have separated sidewalks. Um, whereas a shared street might not have a separated sh sidewalk, but it's meant for two-way traffic, and it's designed in a way that slows track, sl slows car speeds. Um, and so they're just different um, design, um, designed elements. And um, but we want to make sure that if people, if someone comes forward and wants to um, design a, um, a one-way driveway or alley, we want it to be designed like we would if it were going to be a street, so that we have a consistent standard for how it's laid out, how wide it is, what the pavement depth is, all of those things. Um, so that we're treating all of these um, access ways equally across the board in zoning and in subdivision. So you're saying there's a definition for each of these terms for street right. that's elsewhere. Right, or that will shortly there be will, elsewhere. Yeah, yeah. We had to put that on. If we put this, this together, then right. we'll be elsewhere. So yes, there is a little bit of a problem with timing, but based on the conversation that you all have had as a board, this is moving, the subdivision regs are moving in the right direction. So that's why we've been moving down this path. So this is giving folks basically three choices. It's saying, right. You know, they must be designed to function either as private alleys, shared streets, right. or hill streets. Right. Is, is it possible that that sentence ought to be moved up to paragraph three and then be made consistent? Don't they both deal with the same subject? Um, well, three is more about. Well, they're similar. Seven is really more about the construction just, materials just the last and the design. Of seven. Right. Yeah, the last oh, sentence. the last sentence. Oh, um, yeah. I, that's one talks about driveway right. and roadways, and right. the other one talks about right. driveways right. or private roads. Okay. And yep. Somehow it seems like the same subject in order to be consistent. So merge those. Mm -hmm. we'll pull them up and merge I'm just a little this. confused is the term, the first word, driveways, there. Driveways, I envision, is like the driveway that goes, you know, my garage. Driveways shall be designed to function as private alleys. It just doesn't make, I'm not making sense of that. Well, I can see private roads. 
the, the, the issue would be someone could, you know, maybe it's not cost effective to build a huge wide driveway for a smaller project, but we want to create some parameters by which people design these things so they're not overbuilding a system. And so if you're going to build a driveway, we want to make sure it's narrow and um, meets um, the same kind of standard we would think about for a private alley. So again, it's for seven or more units, not a single family home. So it wouldn't apply okay. in that context. Okay. Or two family or a three family, it wouldn't apply. So within this development, we are talking about the transportation, what we think of as roads being called driveways or roadways. Right. Okay, so we need to be consistent. In three, we are driveways or roadways, and in the sentence we're just talking about moving up there, yeah. it's driveways or private roads. I know you mean the same thing, but let's use private the same. alleys, private roads. Well, the I, I guess in three it was really meant to be more generally they could be public or private roadways, um, but we could. But I think you're right; it's not consistent. But I guess the issue is sometimes we're going to have a big project like the build out alignment, and it could in fact be a situation where someone comes to the city for street acceptance. Right. Um, I, I liked your idea of moving it up there, but now I'm getting the distinction that Carolyn was making in three, it, it's the public roadway, and in the sentence added, it's the private. Is that why? Uh, it wasn't intended to be that way, but I think um, it makes, it probably makes sense to say that it doesn't matter whether it's public or private, but they should all be designed this way, because that's the way of the, that's the way the subdivision rules are set up, is Here's the way you build a road, and it doesn't matter what, whether it's public or private is a separate conversation with city council, not with planning boards. Right. So I think it really, we would need to say public or private in three, and it, I'll just figure out a work, way to merge those two. Okay. So it's added, but that we're not inconsistent in the language. And if you don't, if you don't succeed in merging them, my suggestion would be take what's in seven that we're talking about okay. and make it four and move so that they're spoken about together okay. and the distinction is clear that one, sure. if, if you can't merge them, how come? Because so close. Right. I think, okay. I think she will. Yeah. And I like the idea of moving it up. Okay. Moving on to eight, unless so noted. Buildings shall meet both environmental and portability standards. This is the one that we talked about in the joint public hearing mm -hmm. earlier tonight. So we did have a pick list of four. We now have a pick list of two for two. Um, I'm, I'm, I'll take notes on this. So, so somebody needs to explain, at least to me, maybe everybody else understands it. What are these high standards, low standards, minimum, medium standards? I, there, what I, do we require? From the environmental perspective, yeah. I think they're high standards, but not unachievable. They're not so rigorous that you can't achieve them. Um, based especially on local information from the building commissioner indicating that in fact we're getting pretty close to that now and the stretch code is going to be stretched further to, to come down well, lower. Well, I'm, I just happen to be dealing with a lot of insulation issues now and have been talking and what I'm told is that the stretch code is extremely difficult to achieve. I mean it's already the minimum requirements of the new code are quite demanding. So. That's, I haven't seen that in my, my experience, that the stretch code is, is difficult to achieve. So I'm not sure what, what he's... What An he's insulation doing. contractor, I, I don't know, he told me that. Does it make a difference whether you're dealing with existing building or new building? Are you talking about renovations or new construction? Because for new construction, we're not seeing that. I mean, I think there are a lot of all a lot of the housing going on up at Village Hill right now is below 30, and some of it's with PV, but um, some of it is what? with um, solar panels. Oh on. right. Uh -huh. um, well, but again, bearing in mind that's extremely expensive housing. But it's also expensive for other reasons, not just the energy code. That's I, presumably one of the reasons. I, I don't know what makes it expensive, but it is. Right, but I'm just showing, showing that as an example. Yes, that's high-end housing, but they're way below this 41 standard is what I'm saying. Um, and so 
knowing that you know the average right now, even without the stretch code being, um, you know, having been um, amended yet. Um, it's also new construction. I'm wondering if you were to rehab something to the credit. That's, what I, was, to that's what I was wondering. You know, that would, okay. and that's always more expensive and more difficult to do. For me? No. Well, we're talking about new construction. Right. Yeah. For the most part, this would be new construction. Okay. Right. Yeah. And I don't know if this is a Carolyn or maybe a Carla question. Are these two things mutually exclusive? I mean, can you do. Can you actually do what we're asking people to do? I mean, is that a reasonable expectation? Uh, I guess maybe the same as what I'm mean, you know, We're not asking something that's, we might be asking something that's, you know, admirable and, and you know, a stretch, whatever, but can these two things actually be accomplished? I, I just want to make sure we're not setting up a. Question. I think we've had this conversation internally, and I think, you know, the devil's advocate says public comments. I mean, board coming. Can't hear over you. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, you know, we talked about this. It's it's not a very difficult standard to meet if you're someone doing this already and you're you're building and you're. Um, but I think what it and so internally we have this conversation. Well, maybe it's not maybe it's not low enough. Maybe it's too easy. But the other side of the argument is, well, if we make it a little bit more challenging, it'll raise up the level for all the builders who aren't really pushing the envelope. They're doing the very minimum now under stretch code, but it'll bring them. So we're not we're going to have a whole range of developer types that come forward for these projects. Some of them, and, and so I think it'll push them harder potentially. But, but it's, it's not going to be impossible. Okay, I think yeah, that was just I, yeah, it was more like. Is the affordability question. Right. Like it's it's yeah. expensive to live in a green house. Like how is it really feasible to produce something at that level of energy efficiency that is also affordable? Well, and one thing I liked about it is that the LEED certification itself has a price tag extra for getting the certification. So I liked the fact that we're giving them an alternate. The only question I've got, and this is just another, it's like the 10 foot problem. It's 41 sounds like such an odd magic number. <laughs> 40 or yeah. 44. Five. <laughs> well, we started out at 45. 45. Yeah. And, you know, then I, I guess the idea is, and I don't pretend to be an expert about it, but, you know, each, I, it's one of those things I think you can make leaps and bounds at one level and then you start making smaller leaps. Well, or tell me lower. it came from some. You know, to get below 41 requires... No, it did not. Okay. We wanted to go below 45, but maybe 40 was too far. But why did you want to go below 45? Um, because I think it, because it, it's too easy. Too easy. Yeah. Uh, what is, what what is 40, but what is 45? I mean... Well, the stretch code is... What is that, 90? No, 60, yeah. 60? For residential. Okay. For, oh, for residential. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So this is theoretically 25% more difficult than the stretch code. Is that, I mean, how do you, I guess that's about how do you measure, is 40 exponentially more difficult than 45? Is it just a little, I mean, is it linear? Is it linear? Right, is it linear? Is it exponential? what the curve looks like. But I think the current average is below 50. Current of average of, of houses that are coming in. New house. Yes. So we wanted to make it less than the average. Okay. Are most of, where's the, the average of what? Average of village hill? No, of all, all the houses all, all, all around Northampton. Yeah, over yeah. most of which are in the village. Yeah, right. That's I'm wondering. And most of which are in the price range. Of Wait, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's so. the price range? I mean it's yeah, it's I I'm just leery about averages and how they're derived, I'd, I'd sort of like some input. And the other piece of it is, once you, if you have the ability to put solar panels on, it's going to, that solves your problem pretty much. Yeah. If you do. Right. But you can still make it without it. And, I mean, I guess we're talking about the environmental part, but somebody said, 
Oh, you have to do one of each. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, and whether there's conflict. I, I mean, is it common for a planning board to get involved in building codes like this? Um, the, this issue has just come up because, um, well, I, it depends on where you are. And certainly the, the code cannot, the zoning code can't dictate building code items. But this is a special permit criteria. And, it's a, and, and we've heard over and over again that people want, we want new development to be very energy efficient and we want it to also accommodate a range of housing types. And so that's where both of these came from. Um, for the affordability, or the small unit size, um, the affordability, and then the energy standards. So certainly, no, we haven't, the, for Northampton, we haven't done this before. Um, but it's because it's a special permit and there's an option of, you know, how you get there, um, and we already have a stretch code anyway, um, it's not a problem from a regulatory perspective, we think. Yeah, it means that we can legally do it. Yes. Right. Can I ask a quick question about the Bruce reading? It's not something that I'm really familiar with, but is there an opportunity to keep that that 41 or less, um, not necessarily upon review of the site plan, but upon, you know, within one year of receiving the CO or something, like to give people more time to implement energy, energy efficiency measures, or is that? Well, you have to do it, it, you have to do it as you're constructing. Okay. Uh, so there's, so by the time you get your CO, okay. okay. It, it's, it's, okay. Yeah. That's, that was the part that I didn't quite, wasn't sure. Carla, is 41 easy? No, no, 41's not easy, I mean, on one hand, I, I, I kind of would defer to Louie because he sees the construction in the city and can do an average. But then on the other hand, yeah, what, what is the value of the homes you know, that, are, that are being built? Um, I mean, I think anything under the stretch code, we could take pride in supporting. Um, I'm concerned that, that, that it we're going, I'm concerned that we're going too low, given that they also have to meet uh, a criteria out of category B. Yeah, so this was the pick one of the four that you could most easily accomplish, and now we've said one, one, one of each. each. Right. So do I hear a sort of suggested informal nod of your head that we might go back to 45? I would support that. Informally. Then, Though I still don't know what that means. <laughs> yeah, right. It's just a it seems better than 41, but I'm not sure how much better. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it seems like the stretch code is probably going to change over time as well, and that both, you know, 10 years from now, not that we necessarily have to anticipate way out, because you can always come back and spend all of this fun time changing it again down the road, but, you know, if there's a benchmark, going for a percentage reduction on the benchmark seems to me like that would make sense. So 10% better than current stretch code. And that way it's a moving target as the stretch code goes down, this goes down as well. I mean, that's a way to accomplish a future um, changing uh, benchmark. I, I, I am sort of persuaded by, as you say, Louis. Uh, opinion. I mean, he's the man that I actually think goes out and looks at the house mm -hmm. and looks at it. And when he's saying that, you know, they're all under 50 now anyway, mm -hmm. um, I'm I'm with Carolyn in that 45 didn't feel like we were pushing enough. But mm -hmm. I I must say I keep tripping over 41. So, but I'm I'm sort of like John. I'm having to look to you who calculates it and say, does it hurt? You know? <laughs> does it hurt enough? Yeah. <laughs> Are there any other benefits citywide? You know, would we be eligible for any other state or federal grants or any other programs based on a particular citywide average that we should be considering? Or is that at this point? At this point, it, 
at this point, it's if you have adopted the stretch code, okay. then you're on this certain path. Okay. So and we've already done that. So yeah. if we were to change it from 41 to 42, we're not missing out on the particular code or anything like that. And again, I'm sorry, I didn't refresh my memory of the numbers that, that Lily brought forward, but, um, you know, I just... Um, well, you could, and the one, you could answer me that we had it at 45 and there was an interest to reduce it some, so we took it 10% below that and it ended right. up at 41. I mean, that's, I mean, that's some we sort have, of logic. We have to remember that this is a, I mean, a, a developer, if they think that the public is demanding um, more highly efficient housing, which is presumably the bet that the people at Village Hill have made, um, then they can still do it. We're just, this is just a minimum requirement we're enforcing. So is that back to 45 or? <laughs> <laughs> or 42 and a half? <laughs> well, I mean, I think, I think part of this is in recognition that the, the, the larger community, the, the two communities that are most worried about development because there's some opportunity for it in their in their war uh, are, are are wanting us to set the bar high. I mean that's where that I think this is coming from. And and I think that's why we have public hearings and that's why we go hold the meetings and that's that's where this derives from. Well again, I mean if it's at forty five it's significantly lower than the stretch code, I mean, it's certainly not an easy hurdle to get over. Um. But, right, and just know this year, it's anticipated the stretch code's changing. Two. They don't know yet. They haven't decided on a number. <laughs> they. <laughs> well, maybe that is a good idea to tie to that. That's always something. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'd kind of rather have them set it than me who knows nothing about it. And, and be below it. That's what we want to do. <coughs> it's also interesting. You don't like that idea, Carol. Use our average. No, 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 no. I'm not. I'm thinking about it. Uh, I, I don't have. I mean, I think it's it's, it's, it's a sound. And, you know, well, we don't want think, to be higher. You know, in right. a couple of years. No, I think you should the, be more often. We're agreeing with you. <laughs> I think <laughs> that it makes sense fun. too. Then you don't have to always go back. It right. changes right. every two right. years. Right. You're going to be back. Right. <laughs> well, so I think there's a lot of value to that. There is because I think this, as a technology and as a building practices, they are changing, changing so I'm bit. liking that idea. Mm -hmm. So, 10% below? Below that. Well, well that's it? not enough. No, it doesn't have 60, did you say? Yeah. 20%. Well, right. 20. 20. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 20%? Yeah. Wait, now we're 40. 40. That's... No. 20% no, below 60. Yeah, so 20% below 40. 40. 40. 40. 40. 40. 40. 40. 40. 40. 40. 40. 40. 40. 40. 40. 40. 40. 40. 60. 60. 60. 20, so 25 would be 45. 45 percent. Right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. 20, 25. 25 is a lot. <laughs> 25 <laughs> would make it 45 now. Do I hear a bid for? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so okay. All right. I don't think like it's. Okay. Do we have? Um, we do have some input from someone. No. I mean, Carlo apparently knows something about this. None of the rest of us do at all. I'd like Google it. I'd like to credit. <laughs> I'd like to credit Carolyn with knowing quite a bit about the last trip. That's why we're just to, to guide us. Right. Um, yeah, Carolyn and Carla should sit down together and decide. Um, so I think we sort of we, have, we we're, this is not a voting element, but this is a we've settled at twenty five. Well, we need to revisit it. We right. will. Yeah. So ultimately, you would be voting to recommend that change to mm -hmm. ordinance committee, right? Mm -hmm. right? And that would be a number that is presently higher than the one that's there, but has the opportunity to decrease. Right. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I'm at eight B. Do we have anything else about affordability? Uh, I do. So the way it reads, um, contain 25 percent or more of the units no larger than 1,200 square feet of gross floor area for at least five years from street occupancy. So in five years, they would like tear down a wall? Like, like, no. I don't understand. No, you could add on. So if you had a unit that was 1,200 square feet to comply with this, uh -huh. it allows flexibility for people who are just coming into the market. They're 
situation kids, changes. Yeah, they, children. they want to stay there, but they want to still expand. So it doesn't mean that you have to be at 1,200 square feet in perpetuity. But could you be at 1,200 square feet at whatever the market will pay? This right. doesn't seem to speak to right. the it's not price. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, it's, 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 it's 1,200 square feet right. in the right place. Right. On the square foot, right. Right. I mean, yeah. I right. But the idea also was to say, let, let's encourage people to build a range of housing types. Small, we, we, you know, there's a demand for smaller housing units. They may, it may be also associated with a smaller price point because you're not building as big a footprint. Um, it may not because you opt to put all sorts of things on the inside. Um, but it, the, it wasn't just purely about affordability, it was about size too and offerings. And so I think necessarily if you're buying a big house that's a four bedroom house and that's the only thing that's out there, but you really only need 1,200 square feet, you're going to be paying, I mean, it's more all around to maintain, build. I, I guess I just, I, I don't see it related to affordability. I mean, yeah, maybe affordability, they're not, maybe they shouldn't be called affordability, it just kind of confuses. I mean, the, the, the number one, you know, it talks about tying it back to the definition of affordability, but mm. I, I don't know, number two just doesn't, if you build a bunch of 1,200 square foot places at Village Hill, they're not going to meet the affordability standard. I mean, they're not going to be quote unquote. They're not. They're not going to be affordable. Well, also, we, wherever they are, if they have luxurious interior finishing, it will be expensive. Okay. Well, do you? So it sounds like you don't like it being labeled as affordability standard. It's, so it's, if we change that it's language, it's I mean, it almost seems like an environmental standard in some senses because it's using fewer building materials. It's produced. You know, it's right. more energy efficient More than a four bedroom. Right. It's you know. You could just delete the word affordability and say one of the following the, standards. The thing that's kind of funny about it, and I don't have a problem with this statement at all, but what it seemed like some of the folks at the other zoning forum were concerned about was density. And isn't there a scenario where if someone were planning on building five units at 2,000 square feet and they had to build smaller units, you would end up with a net increase in the total number of units? Like, I think that's great, personally, because I'm, you know, I support density and urbanism, but it seems like requiring smaller units to, to meet that 25% standard, you might end up with a, a total increase in the number of units. You know? Well, the piece I've got, I, I'm gonna, a little bit of a twist in it, is that the square footage building cost um, is not, it's, it's not linear, right. that, that it, w once you build the kitchen and the bath and the things that have to function, right. <clears throat> adding on more space in an extra big room right. is not, that's true. you know. Um, so that's, I'm, I'm just not sure what, what it's exactly getting at. I mean, I happen to like the, the idea of promoting small units. I think that's going to happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm in a neighborhood where all the big units have been cut up to the point that they created that. It's just going to happen. It's kind of but, like the market. There's something to be said for letting the market, you know, uh, drive this too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So does it make sense if we just struck affordability out of there but still kept the standard? Why do you want yeah. the standard? If well, it's, it's not to make it. If it's not, I mean, I think while a small house doesn't have to be less expensive, on average, smaller houses are going to likely be less expensive. I think that was, I think the idea behind this came out of the um, comments about really wanting to see a range of housing types and not all big houses absorbing these, or big units absorbing these, but build, but encouraging smaller units for this. So, so the different have starter, starter housing and all that sort of thing. What's that? So <coughs> people would have starter housing and that sort of or thing. Or maybe change of lifestyle housing. They don't need right. the big house anymore. They're downsizing or... But they still know. want the amenities. <laughs> they want to be down, they want to be walkable to downtown. So. Well, and I'm with Bill and that the market ought to take care of that, but I'm reminded of when we, you know, drew the line on Hospital Hill for, you know, single families and they came back with duplexes. And I think that, you know, isn't going to exactly be this story, but that's kind of what we're hoping that this is getting at. Mm -hmm. Well, I think there's something to be said for a range of housing options. I think it, it, 
it's, it's fine if it's just you could strike the word affordability and it accomplish the same thing. Okay. Moving on to nine, unless somebody shakes their head no. Um, just back to the 10% uh, of the units. I guess, okay, so we're going to go either or there. I, one of the comments tonight was that the city has to maintain a certain percentage of affordable housing to get certain funds. And, you know, if there's, a, if there's, a, if there's a time and place where we're well within that guideline. Well, so Does that it still was. still make sense to me to have this? Or so it's not about funding, about? it's about state um, regulation. So. Um, right, okay, I remember, yeah. So if you don't have, um, if a city or town doesn't have at least 10% of its housing units affordable to people meeting 80% of their immediate income, then your town or city would be subject to um, what's called a 40B application in which someone could come in and ask for all the waivers from zoning that they possibly could to just put in as many units as they want in, in a location. Northampton is currently above our 10% sort of state threshold. So we're not subject to, um, you know, we're not going to be, um, someone can't come in and, and get a permit that essentially overrides all the zoning that's applicable to a certain district. Um, we do allow some of those types of projects, um, which are called 40B or comprehensive permit projects, um, as friendly comprehensive permit projects with very few waivers. But um, so that's where the 10% comes. So the idea is you, as a city, both from a policy perspective, we want to make sure that we have enough affordable housing to meet all the needs of people who actually can't afford, need subsidized housing and can't afford to pay their own way. Um, but also, we don't want to fall below that 10% threshold. And so, you know, even though we're above it now, there's no guarantee that unless we continue to develop affordable housing that we would stay above that 10% threshold. So that's where 10% came from. Originally it was 15% when it was a pick list of one to four, one of four options. But when it got divided further into one from each category, which now we dissolved the second category, um, we dropped it to 10% because that is really sort of the statewide. So minimum. we're talking about the kind of project that could most influence the percentage because it's adding the most number of units and less, you know. So I think it's it's just a way to sort of say we meet it now, we want to make sure we keep meeting it. No, yeah, no, I get that. And I think it's important that we keep meeting it. I, I guess what I'm saying is is if there is a you know, a low income housing project, say uh, built where Northampton Lumber is, mm -hmm. you know, and I don't know how many units are gonna put there, but say there's thirty units or something, I don't know. You know, and then um, someone wants to do a smaller, high-end, uh, um, you know, development with seven units, and you know now the city is instead of 12 percent, we're 13. You know, we're well within the qualification limit. You know, do we still have to impose this regulation, this kind of? Well, then the option would be to build a 1,200 square foot unit, or 10 percent, or 25 percent of the units being smaller. So you wouldn't have to do the 25, the 10 percent affordable. Which I'm not quite sure what that solves, but yeah, okay. Is 25 percent the right number? It's a lot. I mean, I guess yeah. I, 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 I support this, but I wonder if we should somehow tie it back to how how well we're doing as a city in meeting that. Yeah, I mean, I guess it gets to. Um, and and sort of projecting about where we might be with new projects coming. I mean, we don't know the lumber yard and Northampton lodging hasn't come forward, so we don't know exactly what those units are. We're losing some units too, and so it's. Um, it's sort of a, it's a moving target. target. <laughs> but if I understand what you're saying, Bill, is you're saying if the, the as a community we've met the standard and we are exceeding the standard, 
thing. Why should some developer that's coming in and doing this project, why does he need to carry a burden of something that we've already met? Yeah, that we're well, what we're comfortably meeting. But if we don't keep meeting it, then at some point. Right, and these restrictions, again, they're 30, well, so we're talking about changing, potentially changing the home ownership units to 30 years. Right now, it's, I mean, we've gone through some of these restrictions where there were 30 years on the books, and now they're coming up for renewal, and we're losing units sometimes with right. them. So over time, that is always in flux. So we're not just because we have, a, it's not a static number. Um, and I think the other piece of it is there's, there's been a whole lot of decision making from the city, different boards, housing partnership, city council, about wanting to maintain um, not just the minimum, but that we want to make sure that we're providing um, enough affordability to meet the demand within the city. And there's still a lot of demand for those types of units, even if we are above 10%. I think sure. we're at 11.1 or something. Right? When you're figuring that all the single family houses that are built are on the opposite side of that balance, are they not? I mean, all the single right. ones that we have no control. I mean, right. anyone who goes out and buys a piece of property and puts it down and the other piece is of working it is, the other side of that equation. Right. And the other piece of it is, the idea is that we want these things dispersed. We don't want the just the ones to be downtown or just to be in a certain area. So if these are, we're talking about the urban residential B and urban residential C neighborhoods, that's, you know, all around downtown and parts of Florence. So um, that way we could potentially get more dispersed housing that's not just clustered or defined in one section of town. Item nine, she says carefully. <laughs> okay, so item nine is intended to say we recognize that there's a lot of expense in doing the full, complete package from the very get-go to come to us, but we want to have five specific things that we expect to see in a preliminary plan, and then there's a, uh, a sort of um, recognized out in the end that says that if we're not going to end up with a, a very general plan that that you're not telling us all the details about. And it's going to indicate that it comes back to the planning board. Review mm -hmm. of the fully engineered plans by the planning board. Mm -hmm. Huh? <laughs> Did I use that word? <laughs> you use the same. Yeah. The same term for park slash open space here and in. The yeah, floor. common area. Park slash common area. Okay. Good. Okay. So we've got a choice now. We have two more items on the agenda. This is item number one, and we can. And I'll look around for sort of a nod. We've discussed each one. We've made corrections. Do you want to see it completely on Thursday, between now and Thursday, and vote on it then? Are you comfortable with the changes and want to vote on it I think it would be good to see the language that Carolyn changes. Okay. Do you want to continue it till then? Thursday. Okay. And see the full, can you get us the So you, you could now. also, <laughs> yeah, hopefully the system will be back up tomorrow. Um, you can also close the public hearing but not issue a recommendation. Right. And and decide to do your recommendation on Thursday. Okay. okay. I think so, just because I think we've done that. We've yeah. been open for yeah. I, I don't feel like we have shortchanged that process. Right. No, I think nods around. Good. Nods around. Mm -hmm. Okay. So moved. Second by John, seconded by Ann. Close the public hearing on. Um, well, if you're closing the public hearing, can I make a public comment? Fast? Yes, you can. Just very fast question, not a comment, a question. <laughs> I, I am understanding that this is part of a, it's a special permit process within a subdivision bylaw. Or How does order? this relate to the subdivision? Doesn't. It's just urban infill lots. So my only question is, and, I, and if you don't, if it's a complicated answer, I don't need to do it now because I couldn't get here before. 
but um, my concern is for uh, infrastructure impact in the broader neighborhood. This addresses what happens on the site. Is there any place that the impact of an infill subdivision or development has on the infrastructure of the neighborhood it's being built in, the additional, the impacts on the roads, the impacts on traffic flow, whatever? Um, that's already incorporated in the current zoning. That's what I wanted to know. Yes. So I could find what those guys, they have to address, anyone doing this needs to address yes. those guidelines. Yes, and, and they, I'd be happy to talk with you. Yeah, no, that, you I, was to, I was going to, I was going to, I was totally going to hang fine. out and do that yeah. after the meeting, but I just wanted to know the answer yeah. to that before you shut it down. I want a little concern about <laughs> infrastructure yeah. in the middle. You're so <laughs> noted and you've waited us out. I, I, no, it was good. <laughs> I've attended many planning board meetings. This is a high quality one. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell Mark. <laughs> there you go. We have an unsolicited opinion. <laughs> so we're going to send us. Um, I've got a, a, a motion and a second to close public hearing. Thank you Thank for you. typing up. Can I uh, take a vote? Everyone willing to close public hearing on the 7 plus zoning? Thank you much. Uh, Carolyn will get it on our next agenda for you've got 48 hours and you can get these changes to us, maybe if the computers gods let you. Okay. I'll break into this building. All right. So. Well, if not, I mean, we don't have a heavy agenda Thursday, right? We could. We, right. Uh, yeah. We could just if I, I could still get it posted because I would break into this building. Or, and if I can't get the changes to you, I, I should still them. do it by Wednesday or Thursday. Well, you can, and we should be back up yeah. again. You can post it. The, the changes to us are better earlier, but that's not a 48-hour window. Right, right. That's what I'm right. saying. Okay. Yeah. Sorry you're not going to be here. Sorry. Um, still what's email. your appetite for items three and four? Appetite. Shouldn't have mentioned the word. Shouldn't mention the word appetite. <laughs> I, I would entertain the deferral of those until Thursday. So, Tess and Bill. Okay. I'll put those on the agenda too. Yeah, you have to do it. No, actually, it's not a lot of extra work. The, that printed piece that we work I'm going to work on that yeah. one too. Okay, good. Thank you. I have a party of out of town guests going on in my absence. Do I hear a move that we adjourn? So, by John and Carla.